Welcome everyone to our semi-final round for the Final Fantasy VI Worlds Collide Battle Royale Tournament. Uh, this is our, uh, our round of all of our pod winners. Uh, each week uh, we had uh, individual pods of people running where the lowest time was eliminated. And uh, last week was uh, the last round of those pods and we now uh, have those winners, these seven runners uh, going, uh, going, uh, going at it. Um, I am one of your commentators, Sido Kaiba. And I'm the other guy, Double Down here. And uh, and welcome. Um, joining us, we have Ceiling Cat and Swans, uh, both tracking. Um, as you all will shortly see, we will be showing all seven runners, and therefore, I believe this might be the first time in World's Clyde history that we have two trackers working, uh, working very hard tonight to keep you guys updated. And then we also have uh, Saberwolf uh, with the restream and also with all the different graphics and overlays that you will see throughout this stream. Uh, so major shout out to him. Give him a follow for all of his hard work. Cito, this is the this is the biggest Final Fantasy VI Worlds Collide event we've ever seen. This is this is history being made. A scale of one to ten. How excited are you? I'm really excited, really nervous to be uh, to be calling this because uh, there's gonna be a lot of action. Things are gonna be going fast. Uh, obviously, these are some of our best runners. These are our top seven in the tournament. Obviously, they're gonna be you know they're gonna be moving fast already. If it was a one v one race, there'd be things we're gonna, that everyone's gonna be missing. Uh, and with seven, there's just gonna be a lot of a lot of action, a lot of craziness. So stick with us. We're gonna have a lot of fun. Uh, this is gonna be great. And I think we're ready to do some uh, some racer introductions. We have a little uh, uh, we have a little introduction for each racer. If uh, if, if, uh, if the truck wants to cue that up, yep. So I guess uh, we're starting off with Fantastodon, who he came out of the Ultros pod. Now Fantastodon entered this event third overall, and that playing around at the very start. Uh, came through the Ultros pod, beat out the Schwantz, Edgeworth, Mark, Holgart, and uh, he did it all in 8 hours, 13 minutes, and 55 seconds total across the entire event. Our next runner is Dr. DT, uh, coming out of the Poltergeist, aka the Spicy Chicken pod. Uh, Dr. DT was uh, ranked 16th seed overall. Um, and had a total time of 8 hours, 31 minutes, and 25 seconds. Uh, beating out uh, JS, bunch of numbers, uh, A Silverthorn, uh, Sid, and WR, uh, WR Jones. From the Goddess Pod, we have Hash Malum taking a break from hexing people on stream to dominate the competition from the Goddess Pod. Uh, came in at the 11th seat overall. And in seven hours and thirty-eight seconds total, seven yeah, seven hours and thirty-eight minutes total, he defeated Sentient Flatbread, Lunar Chimera, Boo, and Drulith. Next up, we have Green Monkey from the Doom Pod. Uh, Green Monkey was uh, the twelfth seed overall in our qualifiers, and uh, ent enters this round at a combined time of eight hours, twelve minutes, and forty-three seconds, beating Hefe. Uh, my fellow commentator, Double Down, uh, Flurry14, and Javinator. Uh, Green Monkey's also one of two upsets uh, from last round, um, uh, toppling uh, the the frontrunner Javinator in his pod. Out of the Guardian pod, doesn't, doesn't he? Second seed overall, came in at the top and has not stopped since. Uh, in a very, very brisk six hours, and 49 minutes, he has managed to beat out, uh, oh, did I skip one? Yeah, I skipped one. Anyway, you know what? We'll do Dusty. Uh, beat out Amalas, Destin Feroda, Zenobian, and Ficta. Yeah, we can cue Zelfer back up. Uh, Zelfer came from the Inferno pod, uh, coming in at the ace seed overall, the qualifier, getting through uh, these rounds with a total time of 7 hours, 27 minutes, and 23 uh, seconds. Uh, beating Lizer Bean, Dust Lamont, and myself, uh, Seto Kaiba, therefore coming from obviously the best pod of all the pods. 
Seto, you told me you were undefeated before we started this. <laughs> Finally, last but not least, Kilbasiago out of the uh, illustrious Toilet Atma pod. Uh, six seed overall, and in eight hours and 15 minutes, he managed to beat out some stiff competition in Markopolis, Lenophis, Ketoisism, uh, and Jolly Green Ray. Uh, a tour de force from all of these competitors, and I think... Uh, I think we can all see that this is going to be a, a pretty tight race here tonight. I don't think we're going to see too much, uh, too many easy wins being coughed up this time. No, we have a good mixture of runners here. We have some kind of, you know, uh, some newer runners such as Hash and Dr. DT, plus some of our uh, our tournament staples. We have, you know, previous winners, Dozen, Zelfer, and Kel also in the mix. So this is really exciting to see, you know, Who's going to continue on? Are we going to see some new upsets? Are we going to see some new runners in the semifinals? Uh, I personally can't wait, and I think we're going to be ready to start in a minute. Um, just waiting on word from uh, from our truck on when the when the runners are queued up. Um, but uh, before we start, uh, Double Down, did you want to give an overview on these uh, the flags for this round? Yeah, let's talk about the flags a little bit. So obviously, if those uh, those of you who have been following Battle Royale to now, pretty familiar with it. We're looking to uh, recruit six characters and nine espers to get to Final Kafka. There is a skip. There's a skip. As long as you recruit nine characters or find 12 espers, you get to skip Inferno. You get to skip a four and a half minute walk of shame. You get to go right to the switches. Now, we do have a few bonus objectives floating around. We have the Dragoon set. Get yourself a, all you need to be the next Kane Highwind. All you've got to do is set that Zozo clock. Uh, there's a lot of honest people in Zozo you can talk to, and they're going to tell you exactly what you need to know to get there. We also have an Illumina floating around. You have to do some uh, some fun, exciting checks that everybody likes doing. You've got to do three of the Fenax Tower, the Leet River, the Opera House Disruption. You've got to ride the Phantom Train, and you've got to plumb the treasures of the Phoenix Cave. Of course, we also have to worry. Every time you fight those first two dragons, the dragon, the, the, the dragon levels are going to go up, and uh, people are trying to get a couple cheap espers by going to the auction house or going to the zen thief that's going to spike some levels as well so you've got to be really careful trying to get those easy ones and then of course compared to previous weeks we're seeing a, a little bit tighter of an opening less starting gold um no more of this multi-summon stuff we're, we're in the big leagues now and there's no uh, there's no easy wins for these racers yeah in particular this week compared to two weeks ago the biggest changes involve our checks our progression we have no free progression on, which eliminates about, I think it's either seven or eight uh, checks that are the quickest checks in the game. Now do not give characters or espers. Furthermore, uh, these ch these checks will also increase progress, even though, the, uh, well, increase scaling based off progress, even though they are not giving progress themselves, uh, which really changes up how our runners are going to approach this. They have to really change a lot of their opening strategies uh, given, given these. Uh, but we are off. We have a Yumaro Gal Strago check. Uh, I saw health on someone, and of course Yumaro has no um, um, Yumaro has no abilities. But it looks like almost everyone's electing to go with Narsh first. Uh, pretty uh, pretty safe early early start um, with how shops are shops are now uh, they are now tiered uh, random, and therefore. How our runners approach the early game with how they're checking for shops can be a lot different than you might have seen in the early rounds. Yeah, it's a it's a big difference, and I'm I'm surprised to see everybody go the exact same way. Um, now, of course, from here we're going to have some interesting options. Obviously, between Gao, Strago, both of those have a couple early checks that we might see people go to to get some fixed encounters in early. And also, there's a Yeti. I'm not sure that we'll be seeing too many Yeti checks early on. The the cave is a it's a bit of a hike up there and a whole world away from where our runners are right now. But uh, I think it'll be interesting to see where people go from the, the snowy town of Narsh here. Yeah, definitely interesting start. Yeti uh, leaned to only one check and, of course, offensively being very limited early is going to probably be overall a handicap for our runners. And Strago, in my opinion, has the worst checks in the, in the entire game. Uh, but Gal really works well early. You know, our runners have all found uh, dry, uh, dried meat in this first shop here, and they can easily use three characters routing, going to the Velt, and then uh, doing Serpent's Trench very easy. Get those levels, 
uh, before we get any scaling um, would be kind of how I would approach it um, and be able to get two checks in very quickly. So we'll be, I'll be curious to see where that kind of leads and if uh, neither of those are a character, are we going to see some of the, you know, bad Strago checks kind of early on and uh, seeing what our runners decide will be very interesting. Uh, as we're seeing some people go to the Returner's Hideout and one check on the uh, the Narsh monster in a box, finding a, a simple, calm, quiet Lobo. Uh, yeah, it'll be really interesting to see where things go from here. Now, it's a little lighter on offense. I did notice that we've got health and we've got GP rain. Those are not exactly offensive powerhouse abilities, so it'll be interesting to see if our racers sort of temper their intro. And I don't know that we'll see too many big, bold starts of people trying to go slay a dragon first thing. Yeah, I mean, it's good to see health early because now you know that late game you have that little, you know, that little bit to fall back on. But our runners really going to be trying to look for some sort of offense early, whether it is lucking into a good Esper or maybe trying to find, uh, you know, something in a chest that can maybe get them through some of these first few fights. Because I do agree that uh, it's great with scaling starting as low as, low as it is. Uh, but if you don't have the options to be able to beat them, you might find yourself to be uh, a little pressed with options after enemies get a few levels on them. Exactly. And with 2.5 scaling, bosses scale fast. And, you know, you want to stay ahead of that wave of scaling or else you can start falling behind and start really getting into situations where even if you're not getting outright destroyed by a boss, you might be spending a lot more time on that as than, than you'd really like. And we do see... We do see somebody has finally deviated from the plan while everybody else is looting. Kyobasiago has gone to the Velt. He's encountered that single Lobo. Lobo is the only fight in his uh, random encounter rotation. And he's picked up the masked man, the Shadow. Yeah, and that's really interesting. You can see him instantly go to Ga uh, Gal's father's house and uh, going to be doing a save here. Uh, this is a strat I've seen him talk about before, uh, which is since all uh, since all checks will increase progress, saving beforehand, if you don't like the item you got, you can reset out. Uh, he found a Thunder Shield, which is, you know, a pretty good item, but not game-breaking, but I guess he decided that it is worth the two-and-a-half level uh, progress increase by grabbing it, and I'm curious to see how that's going to play out for him. Uh, Thunder Shield does teach Bolt 2 and is really great defensively, and more importantly, can be used to uh, maybe clear out one of these early bosses very quickly, maybe giving you an edge by defeating a hard boss early on. That's true. We saw that strategy work out really well last week. Um... I believe it was uh, Green Monkey and Javanator in that race where we saw the early shield breaks uh, really opening up some options for some early boss kills. So definitely uh, an option that you don't want to put out of your head. You don't want to save that shield just in case you might get those Merton strats later on. Uh, an early boss is an early boss. Yeah, and um, it's, it's interesting too because now that, like I mentioned before, the Strago checks are not particularly that great, but with Shadow here, we now open up Floating Continent. Four more fixed battles plus three checks, uh, you know, one of which is guaranteed uh, character or Esper. Uh, and Kel picking up an experience egg in South Figaro. Um, I have not seen what other runners have picked up, but it is, I believe, on the World of Ruin. Uh, barrel so that might be a big difference maker if not every runner happens to check uh check that barrel in that world yeah it looks like we're seeing a, quite a number now of experience eggs getting picked up so it looks like the uh the eggs are going to be hatching here pretty soon we're going to start seeing the xp really spike now what i'll be interested to see and, and tell me what you think we'll see you've got an experience egg right now you've got a pretty limited selection you've got strago you've got gao you've got well you've got a yeti and in some cases we've got shadow where are you putting that experience egg right now I haven't seen Shadow's ability, but I would lean towards Shadow because uh, he, both him and Gal have really good stats. You know, most importantly, magic, because that's probably the most versatile stat to invest in early. But Shadow has slightly better equipment uh, as well and has that fight command, which Gal doesn't. So you have more of a chance to be, for a Ragnarok or Lumina at the weapon or Valiant Knife being able to be equipped on him compared to, uh, compared to Gal. So I think that is... You know the safe bet, but you know you it is a gamble. Um, you don't have you don't know what your end game builds are going to be like yet. It looks like Shadow's a, a blitz user, so definitely you know the faster he can get there. And I mean, perhaps we could even see, depending on how long this gets drawn out, we might see him get to level forty two. We might go see him spend what seems like forever in a cutscene with Duncan to learn the bum rush. Yeah, and I think that's ultimately ultimately the play, right? Um, with a normal 
with a normal run, by the time you get the Kefka Sour, you're normally in your late 30s. You, you might get 42 by the time you get the Kefka, and it's not worth warping out at that point. I find it's very hard to get bum rush without an experienced egg or a particularly long seed, which these seeds are not. So throwing that on Shadow really increases the odds of getting bum rush before Kefka Sour. I personally would go for it, uh, but it really is going to depend on what equipment and items of Magisite our runners find. And we are starting to see some deviation here. I think we're starting to see different levels of how much people want to start looting. Uh, we've seen a couple trips now to the other South Figaro. So, you know, the South Figaro, the, the town's so nice, you'll visit it twice sometimes. We've got, I think, a visit down there to uh, World of Balance Zen. Uh, we've got some encounters going on for Cabasiago in the basement of South Figaro. So we're even seeing a few more early fights as another, another shadow shows up on the Green Monkey Squad. Yeah, and I'm curious to see in a little bit, once we get out of some of these initial checks, uh, whether we see Floating Continent first or Serpent's Trench, I think that's going to be really the first big deviation we see with, see with our runners from a macro routing level. Um, but, you know, I, so far it looks like most people have done uh, South Figure World of Ruin, but it, with Seven it's a little hard to tell if everyone has. I'd be curious uh, in the end if any runner didn't, because it seems like that's going to be a big key with that experience egg. And we do also see now Zelfer is floating around in Tamasa. Now, do we think he's going to go into the uh, the famous burning house, the Casa del Fuego? As we also see Hashmallow sitting on the veldt, he could hit the Nikea Trench, which uh, Green Monkey already hanging down the Serpent Trench here. So I'm wondering what we're going to see and if we're going to see any floating continents, as you mentioned. You know, Burning House can be very interesting here. With Serpent's Trench, that's the obvious go-to. But with a big race like this, you know, uh, be able to throw that Hail Mary and do a check you don't think other people are going to do, hoping that that is the key to progress is a strategy. Uh, but it looks like Zelfer just going in there to loot. Uh, the Massa, very good opening town to loot with easy shops and five quick items. Uh, but he is uh, swinging back to you know, Waterloo and Albrook to do a little bit more looting as uh, Kel seems to be doing Serpent's Trench uh, shortly behind Green Monkey. Yeah, and it looks like we're not going to have too much of a hard time on the Serpent's Trench, although we might not also be getting very much XP. We're looking at Repo Men and Vaporates. Those are not exactly scary monsters, so some sort of uh, early World of Balance Narsh monsters, but not exactly the ones who are going to get you uh, a lot of quick levels. Now, they'll get you maybe to level 3 or 4, but after that, it's they're not even worth the time. Uh, you know, run, you know, running away even isn't really worth the time with it. But um, next one's a Naughty, which uh, a little bit more experience, if I, if I remember. Um, I don't have every enemy in the game memorized, but um, uh, I did not see what it gave, though. Um, but yeah, this pool is going to be interesting. We, you know, we're seeing Hash and Dr. DT, and I think Fantasson also heading in here now. Whereas, does it make an interesting play going up to the top of World of Ruin Narsh uh, to do uh, Tritonk and Yumaro and maybe this dragon? And, and what do you think of that play? Because I think, you know, looking at this, if you're looking at a seven-man race, you really want to... I, I'm wondering, is he thinking about taking this where he's going to zig when everybody else zags and he's going to try to find an edge by doing a check that there's a lot of confidence that nobody else is going to take? Do you think that's the play here or do you think it's just a, a deep passion for visiting the home of a snowman? Well, with this flag set, dragons start at level 3. Um, so all enemies uh, start a lot, a lot lower. So taking, these, taking a boss without any checks or taking a dragon without any checks is a pretty smart. Uh, I believe... A, uh, dragons either have between 1 and 2k at this level, closer to 1k. And so, being able to kill it, get those extra levels, and potentially a good item, uh, is uh, definitely a move I've seen runners do in practice and saw a few people do last round as well. Um, I don't know if I would have done it with the offense we have, but so far, it looks like this red dragon isn't causing too many problems offensively, so we'll see if he's managed to, to kind of burst through and take him out. And I think it'll be interesting to see how many other people go for those early dragons. We did see kind of a, a high number of elemental shields at the beginning, and I think that really does open up some possibilities to take these early dragons, as we see, in fact, the red dragon go down for dozen So that'll be a nice, quick, early boost for him, and, and really opening up those options on what checks you want to take and what bosses or, or you know longer checks you're comfortable taking without feeling like you might take a, a loss at the end of a long trip. Yeah, the other thing to mention is with uh, Zelfer. Zelfer uh, now doing uh, the the shadow check. Why also? Um, oh, we have a Terra with um, uh, at the end of Serpent's Trench, which is really going to open this seat up a lot routing wise. Um, but uh, you know, Zelfer uh, 
going to be going in the Serpent's Trench in a minute. You have to wonder, he did a little bit more looting, a little more shopping than everyone else, whether that time is going to factor in at all, because uh, at least so far, he is uh, one small step be behind everyone else, uh, and I wonder how that's going to play in. Yeah, it really, you know, I think we're almost looking at the tortoise hare situation here, where is that extra investment in looting, is it going to pay off? It's it's tough. I, I do think with the chest, you might see some diminishing returns, and I think it's going to be interesting too now with Terra floating around with Green Monkey. What are the options there? You know, are, are we going to see the sealed cave? Are we going to see half the sealed cave in, in no free progression? There's a lot less incentive to do the whole sealed cave, so do you think we're just going to see a quick check to the basement, or is he going to go all the way through? Yeah, the Seal Cave, I think, is one of the most interesting questions about this flag set. When I was practicing for last week, it was something I went back and forth on because the chest density, as we all know, is insane. But we are now at almost the 13 minute mark, and if you go there and you're not getting that, that check, even if you are getting that check, you're getting no progress, is it worth that time investment? I think popping into at least the base and checking the basement definitely is, but I don't know if going through the entire kit cave this early after you've already done most of your shopping is uh quite worth it but regardless it's a time investment that's not leading to progress and that can be uh can be pretty rough so i'm curious to see what runners elect to do it and how much how much of the seal cave they end up doing it does look like we've had our first esper go out doesn't has just picked up stray from the try talk encounter he took out dullahan and uh got rewarded with the little cat esper so we uh we have our first piece of progression on the esper side yeah, and that's the one, you know, one downside of taking an early dragon is uh, you don't get any MP. You get nothing, uh, you have, you know, unless uh, unless you have more, if you're not gaining anything from the, that MP. And uh, that is the one downside of taking an early. And we'll see if our other runners, when they take their first dragon, uh, how they capitalize on that. Because unlike most seeds, taking every dragon on your way is maybe not a good call. Uh, dragons do also increase progress and on top of that increase dragon levels as well so taking that first dragon pretty safe but come your later dragons it might not be smart to go for number three four and five um and uh seeing how our runners pace the dragons is going to be an interesting decision uh in this race uh whereas kel finds a cyan in narsh but it runs into the very long piranha fight uh uh for that check yeah, a bit of a time sink there. 5 to 55 seconds of piranhas. Luckily, it looks like Kill won't have to waste too much time. Meanwhile, we do have Dozent, who's picked up yet another Esper, and we'll have to fight a, an abominable snowman to, to be able to keep it. And according to the chat, he picked up a, a Minerva down there, which, you know, now that we now that we know Terra's in play, is an extremely good uh, armor to find. We'll see if he ends up finding his way to Serpent's Trench like the rest of our runners. Green Monkey electing to uh, to do the Imperial Base Basement, picking up a load of treasure. I didn't, you know, have, I didn't see if there was anything major there, um, but electing to not do the full seal cave, and now is going to Floating Continent. So we're seeing some crazy route divergence right now. Yeah, this is exactly what we're looking for, especially when you start getting these characters that open up all these options. You know, the moment you see Terra, you know, the moment you see Cyan, the moment you see Shadow, there's so many possible ways, a lot of a lot of answers, and I don't think a lot of wrong answers. I think there's a lot of really viable approaches, and we're seeing a lot of them coming from these racers who are, as we've talked about before, some of the best racers in the game right now. Yeah, and uh, one important thing to point out that chat mentioned uh, that is that doesn't picks up his second Esper in Umaro's Cave, but it is Golem. Golem is one of the most important Espers to find because it is the best protection against Calmness for the final boss, and... Uh, if you wipe during the final boss, that is a 10, 15, 20 minute time loss, and that really can turn things around. Having that insurance to know that you're not going to lose one to two people outside of your control uh, right before going into Kafka is really good. And Yumaro's check being a little farther away, and now we're seeing Sabins and Cyans and, and Terras, I'd be very curious to see how many other runners end up... Uh, down to Yamaro and whether or not that's going to factor into the final fight or not. Yeah, really interesting, really comforting, I think, for these runners when you get some of those interesting or important pieces for the final battle early on. You know, it's really, I think there's a, a bit of sort of a, a sigh of relief when you get that early golem or when you get that early siren or mute. As we see now, I think Sabin is uh, is down at the, the uh, Doma Siege, so it looks like we're getting some more characters being added to the groups here. Yeah, and that should give Kel his last character. Yeah, that's character number six of six, and plenty of checks to work with, a lot of which are peekable. 
Meanwhile, Green Monkey finding Brachiosaur up in Flint Continent. Brachiosaur is one of the highest amounts of experience you can find in this game. And being able to get that in at least one fixed encounter and hopefully more is really going to propel him up with, um, uh, with experience. Um, and uh, getting ahead of experience in a, fl in, a, in a seed like this can really be beneficial uh, when sk with... Uh, with dead checks increasing scaling, being able to get that extra level to stay ahead of bosses really can be a big difference maker come Kefka's Tower. Oh, absolutely. As we see a couple of people more, more into the uh, the Welk Cave here, I think you're, you're exactly right. And I think sometimes it's really nice to see those monsters early on before the ability scaling goes up. Of course, this is Worlds Collide. As monsters get stronger, the abilities, they're not the abilities you remember seeing in vanilla. So where you might have seen a Fire 2 in vanilla, here, later on, you're going to start seeing things like Flare Star. So sometimes a lot better to run into these fights early on. Uh, speaking of fights, they don't really love seeing at any given time Air Force uh, down in Kilbasiago screen. And that is sometimes a boss that can give our racers a bit of Ooh. trouble. Yeah, especially with that shrapnel wiping everyone there. And Kel's going to take a reset, which is a little costly. He took a few fights there at some of the fixed encounters at Doma. And be curious to see if he, uh, if he goes back and tries that again. Um, you know... Uh, no, he's liking to leave, putting back at six characters, but he knows that Sabin's there, and that's really important. Having six characters at the 18-minute mark, uh, and everyone else having, you know, four to five, is really, really crazy, because, uh, Kefka Tower Skip is a little hard to go to, uh, while saving time, but if you're gonna end up with extra characters anyway, outside of your control, uh, knowing that this early, knowing that you have to aim for Esper's, can make it so you can aim for the skip and plan it out a little bit better and pace yourself a little bit more. And having something like Sabin early might be worth it. Uh, I'd be curious to see if he ends up going back there. Uh, even though at the moment he has a lot of choices with with Cyan and Terra and Shadow having a lot of checks available to them. Yeah, and I think the other interesting thing too, with no free progression on, now normally I think if you get all your characters first, you kind of struggle, right? Those peekable checks, they're not so peekable anymore because a lot of them, you're not really able to tell whether it is an Esper or just a pair of Marvel shoes, maybe your fifth, sixth, seventh pair of Marvel shoes, depending on your luck. So I think it'll be interesting to see how these all play out now. Um, with Kyobe Asiago going back to Doma, he's, he looks like he might be going back for another taste. Meanwhile, the Burning House looks like it's up, and that's an interesting encounter we we're seeing at the Burning House. That is rough. Uh, Siegfried can be part of the fixed encounter pool, and he just takes up so much time. Uh, he has his little spiel at the beginning, then he does his eight slice attack. You hate to see those fixed encounters because it means there's a chance that each one of these little flames, he's going to be losing, what would you say, 20, 25 seconds to Siegfried's monologuing on each encounter? Yeah, what an absolute time sink. Brings you back bad memories of that train in vanilla. As we do see Locke, Locke showing up on the floating continent. So really tough to find an Esper at this point. Other than Kibasiago, <laughs> I don't think we've seen really any other pieces of magic that get distributed here. So, uh, you know, really kind of shaping what this race is going to look like. And I think we're going to see a lot of uh, shortcuts, a lot of statue skips. I would love to see statue skips. Seeing all these characters, and especially outside of Yumaro, characters that have multiple checks, this route diversions is going to make this uh, race very exciting. Uh, and with the with no free progression, and now knowing that pretty much every runner needs to hunt only for Magisite, is going to make a lot of really interesting routing decisions and a lot of interesting gambles by our runners. Um, I can't wait to kind of see where where this ends up. And uh, Green Monkey fighting Gigantos. Uh, Keep an eye on Green Monkey, everyone. I, I'd, be, I'd be curious to see whether his experience scaling gets way ahead of everyone else uh, with these Brachiosaurs and uh, Gigantos uh, monster, the, monster in the boxes that he's finding. Yeah, two very XP rich. I mean, you know, what's next? A Tyrannosaur for uh, for Green Monkey? I'll, I'll be interested to see that. Hash Bellum not having the trouble that Cabasiago had with uh, Air Force. Takes down Air Force. Cabasiago having to do another reset. So... Uh, uh, some precious time being up as Kabasiogo bounces off the Doma Dream, unfortunately. Now the question is here, you have six characters. Most of our runners, except for Dozen and Fidaston, have six characters, and we know they're going to find more shortly. You know, we know that people like Locke is at the beginning of the of Flowing Continent, so we're probably going to see a lot of runners hit seven characters, potentially. Do you start playing the skip now? Um, I don't think I've ever played it this early in this flag set, but at 21 minutes and having this many, do you just start factoring that in now that that is a thing you're just going to end up getting? 
I mean, I think that's something you have to consider, right? If the skip, if it's on the way, if you're already halfway there and, you know, rather than take some of these resets, maybe that's the way to go. Now, Kilbasiago did warn us ahead of time that he had a, a special play in mind. And it looks like we're seeing it right now is 21 minutes, almost 22 minutes into the seed, Kilbasiago, he's going to Kafka's Tower. He says, you know what? Objectives, I don't care. I'm going right to the tower. Now, what's the play here? What, what's he looking for in Kafka's Tower right now, Seto? I saw some talk on Discord from him earlier this week. Uh, I, it was more about potential changes that he was coding in, but he was musing about whether or not you fight Toilet Atma. Uh, now that uh, Toilet Atma uh, can, um, uh, well, it always could, uh, uh, it could always, it could uh, previously, it could always give an item. Sorry, I'm stumbling my words a little bit. But whether or not you sit here and you fight these bosses early, and in Kel's case. He's going and he's going to fight uh, the Inferno Spot. The Inferno Spot does not increase progress at all, but it is a boss. So it is one of the few bosses you'd be fighting uh, this early that will not increase everyone else's scaling. So interesting play. You have to come here and do it later. You're doing it with, with uh, four characters instead of two, and then maybe go fight a dragon. It, this is very interesting. It's a kind of a, a gamble on his part, um, and I'd be curious to see what, you know, where it kind of takes him. Yeah, and you know, I think in a normal seed, really big play. It's almost a shame that we've seen such a fast character lead incentivizing us to take the skip because the more of that tower he clears out, the less attractive that skip becomes. Yeah, and that's the other interesting thing. With six characters, this play of killing this uh, boss early, you're right, you lose a little of the advantage. If you're doing the skip, it doesn't matter as much if you're trying to take this out. The extra experience is nice. Be able to get the experience out, leveling everything up is great. But with six characters, the odds are you're never you're not going to be fighting that Penumba. Um, and uh, and Kel kind of seen the right on the wall, wall and deciding to uh, bail out there to try someplace else. Meanwhile, Hash taking out his first dragon, doing the optional Opera House dragon, and Dr. DT climbing up the mountain. Uh, so we might see a second person with Golem, and we'll see if he's going to uh, fight this dragon as well. Yeah, it does look like Zulfur is returning from a trip to Mount Zozo. So again, we're seeing a lot of diversity here in, in the approach. Uh, some really interesting order of, of doing things. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of the fixed encounter fights, and we've even seen one person step into the Doma Dream and, and not come back from it. So, uh, you know, we're seeing a few a few checks that are giving people some struggles, and I think it's going to be interesting to see now where they go next. As uh, as uh, looks like Zelfer has decided not to do the Doma Siege. Yeah. And that's really interesting uh, for uh, Zelfer, you know, seeing Sa Saban, and he's probably thinking himself, along with Dr. DT and and Hash, being like, where is my first Esper? We're almost at 25. We have enough for all of our characters. Where is this guy? And uh, definitely, um, you know, you see Zelfer bail out of there, because I don't blame him. You know, you know Saban's there. You can come back wherever, whenever. Doma Castle is one of the quickest checks in the game. You do not need him right now. You need espers. Uh, whereas, uh, it looks like Green Monkey, I believe, picked up an esper. I didn't see it was on it, but my tracker tells me that it was uh, something good. There was some good magic on uh, Zone Seek, I believe. Yeah, it looks like good magic on Zone Seek. We also, it looks like uh, we have a siren coming from Strago's uh, check in the Burning House. So, another great piece of magicite to pick up early. Yeah, you know, it's not a character um, which, you know, maybe Fidassan was hoping to be something gated behind uh, Burning House, but it is the next best thing. It is an Esper that is a guaranteed utility that your uh, your uh, opponents might not have. Mute is very rare, and be able to get uh, Siren, be able to mute tier 2, could be the difference between a wipe or just a big time save, a, you know, a minute or so time save on that final fight. Um, so that is a, a big pickup from him. Between that and Golem, I think we're seeing a lot of very different strategies with some runners come uh, come the final Kefka fight. Absolutely. We're seeing a, a few more trips now to the floating continent. I think uh, doesn't he already there? Zelfer, Fantastodon heading up there as well as Dr. T, T picks up that that uh, Magicite from the back of World of Ruin Narsh. And it looks like Green Monkey has just finished the long, exciting trip on the floating continent. Yeah, meanwhile, and we'll see in a second what he has. Meanwhile, we see Hash taking on uh, another dragon. Um, I, I thought I saw him take... Uh uh, I guess the tracker's been updated. This would, this is his second dragon. He took down Opera House earlier. Um, this is gonna be interesting because you don't want to, uh, you don't want to be taking out too many uh, dragons early. They also increase scaling, and if you take too many out, you could find yourself a very strong 
uh, enemies uh, late game. I know that I personally ran into that, and I'd be curious to kind of see how the scaling ends up factoring in. Uh, whereas Green Money runs into Tritok, not a hard boss, but early on when you don't have a lot of options, your offense, your offensive options could be a little, uh, a little weak. Though I do see Fire Two, so that it sounds like it's a non-factor for him. Yeah, having that Fire 2, great. Also, you know, if you start getting a little scared, Runic also can get some play in this fight. It's, it's one of those kind of iconic Runic fights if you feel like you need that extra defense. Meanwhile, we're seeing more Dragon fights, a Blue Dragon for Hash, a Red Dragon for, for Dr. DT. A lot of Dragons going on here as Doesn't He makes their way through the floating continents. So I think we're starting to see some, some catching up here. We're starting to see things kind of equal out. And I think we'll, we'll probably start seeing people get those second and third Espers uh, pretty quickly, those who have not gotten there yet. Plus, we're seeing two different Ultrases. We have Ultras 4 and uh, his normal spot followed immediately by an Ultras 2. So I guess he did not like the fact that he lost to you and came back immediately for uh, a round 2. Uh, that is uh, always funny to see. And uh, real quick to our viewers, we're having some technical difficulties with uh, with Kelbyaso, uh that our restreamer is trying to sort out. So bear with us as we figure out what's going on with that. Now, speaking of difficulties, Hash Malum has uh, suffered a defeat at the hands of the Blue Dragon. Looks like Hash is going to just move on, uh, not going to take that fight again. Uh, how do you feel about that? Would you go back and, and roll the dice on it again, or would you just cut your losses and move on with the rest of the check? Nah, that, his offense was taking too long with it. Um, you know, like I said, I think the scaling with it was uh, a mistake, but you weren't speeding through it. I, I would go, I would retry if you felt like you just got hit hard, but you could over, you could. Uh, you know, deal enough damage that a second time maybe would be fine, but he was dealing damage too slow. That's something that's a smart move. Um, real quick update for chat coming from our racers chat. Uh, we have a, a forfeit from uh, Kelbyaso. Uh, he, uh, in his words, uh, not finding uh, his footing. Uh, I guess he was not happy with uh, uh, his uh, what he was finding in his play. So. Um, uh, so we are now down to six runners, and the reminder that the top four move on, uh, and uh, and everything. So, um, so, you know, congratulations to Kel. Uh, you know, thank you for the tournament. You played extremely well, and uh, can't wait to see you in the next one. Wow, yeah, what what a what a what a shocking development, Kibasiago, one of the toughest competitors we've seen in this tournament. But it just goes to show you, any given seed, you never know what's going to happen, and sometimes things break really wrong. Kibasiago took a big chance. I thought that uh, that play into Kefix Tower was a, a really next level strat, and I think we might see that affect future races. So uh, even though Kibasiago not in this race anymore, I think the uh, the legacy he's left here, I think we're going to be we're going to be seeing in future races for sure. Yeah, and it's tough. Like, I always tell people to, you know, n never give up. Like, you know, don't forfeit because you never know how everyone else is doing. But there's also your own mental, you know, well-being. We're playing this game for fun. If you're not having fun, if you're miserable while you're playing, if you're frustrated, like, that is also important. Um, and, you know, ultimately make the best decision, you know, for you um, and, and everything. And we'll see him. He's a strong competitor. He's won tournaments. We'll see him again. We'll see more high-level play from him in the future. Absolutely, will. As we see Hash Malum, meanwhile, fighting some tentacles. So I think this is our second attempt at the Dome of Dream we've seen this time. I think we may see uh, a little deeper of a dive. I also see from our tracker sheet that uh, the, the the floating island, the end of that, rewarded a Crusader. And that tracker sheet uh, really, really helping us out. And that's Ceiling Cat and Schwanz27 are running the tracker for this because it's a it's a group effort running these these streams. So a big shout out to those two who are, who are running the tracker. And you know, probably a good time to mention too Saber Wolf once again, who's been doing a, a fantastic job restreaming this, these overlays. Uh, Seto, I don't know how he does it, uh, tracking seven of these streams at once and somehow making his brand new computer not explode. But uh, you know, as we see some more boss fights of number 120 in the cranes, uh, I don't know. I don't know how these people do it. <laughs> Yeah, and especially shout out to Saber Wolf. Uh, he, you know, during the early rounds of the tournament, he was doing a lot of triple duty of restreaming, tracking, and commentating to make sure that while we couldn't get every single pod every single week restreamed, he tried his best within a schedule to make sure that as many were showcased as possible. Um, you know, and did a really great job. And then all the custom graphics you saw earlier, some of the special um, pop-ups you're seeing of the head-to-head -head runners uh, that you're seeing a little bit, that's all him that he spent a lot of time this week working on it. Um, and uh, so shout out to him, you know, send him love in, in Discord and, and everything um, uh, and all that. Uh, meanwhile, uh, 
Hash getting through that tentacle fight. Tentacle can be a little rough early when you don't have when you don't have the offense uh, available to you. Um, you know, just because it can take a little bit of time. But uh, it'd be curious to see with our later runners where if they can make up some of that time when they have a little more levels and a little more uh, a little more offense. Yeah, it looks like it's the place to be. Uh, Hashmal, I'm just picking up Ramu, who uh, not only is an Esper, which, you know, don't even care what spells they teach at this point. If they're a thing in a Magisite, that's something you want to see, but also giving a level three spell and flare. So uh, a few more options there from Ramu, who's opening up that spell list. Yeah, and so that's the other, other question. We've been talking a lot about what's currently going on, but one of the great things about Worlds Collide, in my opinion, is our runners are trying to figure out what is going to be going on in the future. More importantly, what is your final build for your characters? What options are you finding, and uh, what can you par then pivot to later? And so far, I've not seen a lot of things really stand out as, oh man, this is going to crush later, outside of some of our defensive options like Siren and, Go and Golem. Bolt 3, while not a world beater, is maybe the first glimpse into maybe some sort of final build for our runners. Have you noticed any other... Uh, spells or items that really could that uh, runners might be eyeing as uh, you know potential end game offense. You know it's it's tough because I, I I'm not sure what we're gonna see. It's it's I think we're gonna see some late bloomers. Um, now we did see a lot of elemental shields early, which means if we do happen to see one of these many espers hiding in the woodwork, if one of them has Merton, I think we might see some Merton strats open up. Another sort of uh, you know low key kind of below the radar pick. We've seen a few people in their encounters on the floating continent encounter the stray cat, which means yeah. if they can find that rage user, uh, stray cat is nothing to mess around with. That is true. Uh, we've also, we just saw, um, uh, I think it was green monkey there. Uh, just got the Dragoon set from the Zozo clock. A play that we've seen a little bit in the Battle Royale, but not too much. Uh, general consensus with runners is that it might be a bit of a time sink, but it is a guaranteed top tier build. Maybe the bottom of the top tier, but definitely a top tier build, especially if someone can equip, uh, uh, equip the the spear that you that you got. Now we don't have an Edgar or Mog here, and I didn't see uh, yet what spear Green Monkey got, but that is a possibility of something that you know they can they can do. And the other thing too is we have Shadow with Blitz, and some of our runners have put experience eggs on them. Bum Rush is in play for late game. Doesn't help you right now, but uh, as a runner, I'd be eyeing that, especially with some of the options that you know the seed is not giving me at the moment. Now, speaking of things the seed is giving, Hash Malum running into uh, something you definitely, definitely do want do not want to see later on in the Dome of Dream, the Magi Master. Now, Seto, what is so scary about the Magi Master? Well, what's scary in the Dome of Dream is that, um, you know, if you didn't save correctly, you're stuck here. And this is, in my opinion, the hardest boss in the game if you do not have the Zerg. This guy, he is hard to hit. He has insane physical defense. He changes his elemental weakness after every single hit uh and he just lobbies you with the, some of the toughest magic in the game uh this guy is a is a jerk um you know hash pulling off some great runic uh uh strats in order to try to keep it at bay but he takes a wipe you know you, you hate to see it but it, magic master is rough like there's just a lot of good offense you have can just be nullified by his high defense or his changing of elemental uh, weaknesses. And he is a wall if you don't have the right loadout. And uh, I hope Hash took a second save outside of the Dream. Um, I do see multiple saves for him, uh, but he is going to take another stab at this. And I think that might just be the way to do it. I, I mean, it's, it's tough to walk away, especially when Espers are so scarce. You know you've already got one from Ramu. Uh, you know, he, he was close, right? It's not like he just immediately got taken out. He, uh, he's got the runic strats. He might be able to do it with a little RNG and a little, uh, you know, belief. So it'll be interesting to see how the next wave of, uh, the Magi Master attack goes. And yeah, and I'm interested to see Dr. DT too, how he deals with this. Cause the, the same thing's going to happen there. Yeah, and the RNG is really kind of the key here. He, Magic Master has so many different attacks of so many different elements, and you can see that with some of the elemental shields that we found that Hash can absorb some of them, and it might just come down to trying a few times if you think you have the offense to be able to kind of 
uh, get by the hope that you get lucky with the attacks he decides to do. Um, he can attack multiple times in a row, so Runiking uh, sometimes isn't enough. Sometimes you just, you know, he can... That's how Hash wiped D4. He runicked one thing and immediately got hit with another spell before he can do anything. Um, and uh, meanwhile, we're seeing Green Monkey jumping into Kefka's tower early. Uh, similar play as uh, what Kelbiasso did earlier. Um, do you think he's trying the same strategy that Kel tried? I think he's trying the exact same strategy. I think it's uh, the new Cabasiago meta that we're seeing <laughs> unveil itself right before our eyes. It's interesting because Zelfer's been trying a new meta throughout this tournament of when he gets ready for when he's ready to go in the Kefka's Tower, he puts everyone in party four and fights his boss with the full force, hoping that it's a tricky boss that other runners will stumble over with a party of two, and that he the time save he, that he gets from uh, beating outweighs him do doing a double dive, but we're seeing it take it one step further of doing this early, like I said, hopefully trying to get experience before, uh, the, w without counting the scaling, to get a little bit ahead, and in Green Monkey's case, with the amount of experience he's gotten so far right now, really could put him in a good snowball. Yeah, Green Monkey getting a lot of that early XP. We saw him get some some really efficient XP fights early on and run out to that early lead. Just looking at HP totals, it looks like uh, Green Monkey and doesn't have some pretty high level characters. So I think there's a there's a chance there to absolutely snowball over, and I think that really sets them up well. In addition, if they end up going to somewhere like the Dome of Dream, where they might have more of those tools, more of that high end offense to punch through a wall like Magi Master, which we see Hashmelon on attempt two. We see Dr. DT still trying to work through on his first ball. Actually, he just took him down. So it looks like Dr. DT uh, is not being slowed down by the Magi Master. And that's a big, big push ahead of Hashmelon on that one. Yeah, that's a big pickup by Dr. DT, which I think is a good time to sit here and talk about kind of where our standings are. Um, it's hard to tell what r runner is in the lead until we get the Kekas Tower, but we have a rough idea based off of... Um, what requirements have been found so far. We have Dozen at 11 about to pick up his 12th, uh, but it is a character, um, with uh, Dr. DT at uh, 10 and Hash at 8, um, Green Monkey also at 10, uh, Zelfer at 9, and Fidesson at 9. Um, and, uh, you know, that means our, all our runners, you know, Dozen is a little bit ahead when it comes to checks, but with Zelfer about to pick up, uh, I believe, uh, three here at uh, Doma, and uh, Hash about to pick up two, um, you're going to see that kind of, uh, that gap get closed a lot, because in a second, Hash will only be one behind Dozen in checks. Um, Dr. DT Dr. DT is also only behind by one, so this is still anyone's race, um, especially as we've seen some quick checks been done by some runners and not others. Yeah, and don't forget, we still have that skip waiting in the wings too, so we might see a little bit of a leapfrog there because that is really, you know, a four or five minute little skip, especially when you have a, a boss like Fumbaba who can be a little bit time sink. Fumbaba, uh, he's got HP. He's He's got HP and a big green gut, and I think that can really eat up a lot of time as we see Palador going to Hashmalum who has broken through the Magi Master wall. Yeah, and I'd be curious to see his Green Monkey. I would love to ask him in his interview how he ultimately felt about this. Uh, because, you know, we know that a skip's probably going to happen for a lot of our characters. We have, or a lot of our runners. We have, half our runners have seven characters, and we know what Sabin's still out there in a very easy to get spot. Um, I don't know if uh, if necessarily getting, killing Penumba here and taking that, that time investment of, what, a minute and a half, two minutes, uh, is ultimately going to be a, a huge save overall. Yeah, it's, it's tough to say, right? When you can already get that save by just well, just getting a couple extra Magicite or, or characters. But on a seed like this, where characters are coming out of the woodwork, it's uh, it's interesting to see who pivots to that strategy and who kind of sticks with the original plan. Uh, also interesting, going to be interesting to see uh, what kind of checks we, we start seeing for people like Dr. DT and Dozen, where they're starting to finish their characters. And now we see Dr. DT, for instance, uh, trying to, to peek a check and go into the Velt Cave. Also, still kind of grabbing some chests. So we saw Dr. DT looting another monster in a box. Uh, what do you think they're looking for at this point? You know, I think at this point, defensive-wise, they're probably okay, but they're, you know, they might just be looking for some of those extra pieces of fill some of their offense. Um, you know, we haven't seen anything completely game-breaking like Atma weapons or Luminous pop up. Uh, I take that back. There is an Atma weapon at Mount Zozo, which I don't think Dr. T DT's done yet. I have to double-check my um, 
uh, tracker sheet if you give me a second. Um, but if, you know, with Atma Weapon, he could be looking for offerings, he could be looking for, uh, you know, Genji Gloves. Uh, I, you know, if there's too many unknowns of what I'm trying to look for, I, you know, I'm probably better off not looting. Uh, but, you know, it's just always the hope that maybe the, the three seconds on this chest might be enough to get you over the edge and get you something absolutely game-breaking and that will break the seat open even more. That's true. And I mean, we do have, I think, two Atma Weapons float around. I believe uh, Zelfer has one. And uh, I believe also that... Uh, Hash Malum has an ammo weapon, so the options are there as we see Realm in the Imperial Encampment. Now, of course, there is one other piece of offense. Green Monkey showed us one that, you know, there's that off-forgotten objective where you get the Dragoon set from Zozo, but let's not forget, if you do a bunch of uh, everybody's favorite checks, you can get that Illumina, and we have characters who can get there. We've got Strago to get to the Phanax Tower. We've got uh, Terra to do the Leet River, which who doesn't want to do Elite River? We even have, you know, we've got some of these options to go do these extra checks. Do you think we're going to see anybody ride the Phantom Train, ride the river, and get themselves an Illumina? I do not think we'll see an Illumina. Um, you know, we have, of the characters we have, you're right, we would have to do the Phantom Train or the Elite River or Fanatic's Tower. Um, I think Phantom Train's in play because you can peek it. If it is an Esper, I think you'll see uh, every runner go for it. But... There's no reason with these many characters and these many checks to do Elite River, and I would not do Fanatic's Tower either. But that is just, you know, my personal take, because uh, I think Elite River is the worst check in the game, and Fanatic's Tower is not too far behind. I mean, let's let's bear in mind, there could be some people who do Elite River purely for the pleasure of going there. It's uh, picturesque, <laughs> lovely flowing waters. I think a lot of people uh, really enjoy that. Now, I'm also curious to see with Hashmelum, uh, Realm at this point, we've seen... Uh, obviously, commands are shuffled. It's a randomizer, and the randomizer can be random. Uh, what kind of command do you think we'd want to see on a realm that would maybe suggest to Hash Malm that realm, the, the 10-year-old murder child, should be part of his team? Docker throw at this late. I mean, he, we know he got uh, his capture. That, uh, that is that is rough. Um, but, uh, you know, that being said, uh, we know that he got Bolt 3 a little bit late. Uh if you weren't happy with your team, I put in a realm late, even with not a great ability, knowing I could teach her the magic or two I need. Um, but uh, yeah, shock or throw would really be the the big one, since you know you have sword tech already and blitz. You know those are off the table. Let's not forget about magic tech too. Uh, I'm I'm told the tech missile is a, a decent little attack, as we see Doctor DT scouting Mobleys and finding that uh, some little girl does not want them to take Fenrir away. So it looks like Doctor DT is going to go do the Fumbaba three encounter. Now, is there any risk at this point when you're taking this boss and Mobleys? You can only do it with two people. Do you see any risk at this point? It, I mean, it obviously depends on the boss. Uh, I used to think this check was very risky but recently i've been a little more okay with it around this pace in the game you don't want to do it early in the game but you have your characters should all be hopefully st coming together and saying on their own a bit that you know any combination of two characters should be enough to get through it as long as you're not running into like a doom gaze or something you know pretty horrible um you know, I think it's a good call by Dr. DT. I think his party is solid overall, um, and that he probably feels confident that with any combination of two that, you know, he'll probably really get, get through. Um, meanwhile, we have Zelfer running into that Magic Master, uh, also encountering some of the same problems that we saw earlier with Dr. DT and and hash it's gonna be very i'll be very curious to see whether or not he poses more of a problem as scaling gets you know higher for some of our runners and and i do also you know i, I think the scaling it's something that can be very scary i think these runners have done a pretty good job of staying on top of it I, they've had some help i think uh, a lot of them have encountered gigantos uh as well as a brachiosaurus so really some good uh, some good encounters that keep you above it now i want to talk about green monkey a bit again because green monkey's been in kafka's tower for uh, a few minutes. Uh, obviously, this is not Green Monkey's last trip to the tower. Is Green Monkey getting ahead, or you know, is this starting to take some some more time? As a couple bosses have been kind of pre-killed, do we think this is going to keep Green Monkey ahead? Is this time saving now going to be worth it later? What do you think? Yeah, I'm really curious. It is uh, really a huge, uh, you know, a, a, a huge time investment, especially since we know the skips in play. I mean, Hash is grabbing his ninth character right now. Um, you know, I don't really know. I don't really know. Wait a second. Hold on. Wait, how is he even there? He doesn't have enough espers. He, sh he shouldn't be able to get through. Uh... Right? 
I, it isn't the check right before the um the um the switches for the espers, or is that the check for the dragons? So I believe, um, and I think we're seeing in in uh, in chat here too that it's those last three switches that take you to Kefka, so he can do his cutscene. Those are the switches that don't work with the objectives. So potentially you can clear right up, and you can clear all those bosses. You just can't fight Kefka himself. Yeah, so that becomes you know. I, I think it comes back to what I said about getting experience without increasing progress while also killing, uh, you know, blitzing through these bosses with the full strength of your party. Um, it's still a huge time investment. It takes about four, four and a half minutes to walk all the way up here, um, you know, even without fighting fights. Um, but, you know, even if you know, if, if you have to skip, now you can basically ignore the entire second party, right? You can just split people two and two on either side uh, while getting these extra uh, extra experience. It's definitely a play. Um, I don't know if it's one that I would feel comfortable making at this level, but like we mentioned before, this is a battle royale. It's not about being first. It's about not being last. They know that uh, if they if they have Discord chat open, they know Kelby also is forfeited. So they know they just have, they don't have to be the bottom two. As long as they're not the bottom two, that they are good to go. And so maybe doing strategies like this that make your levels a little more comfortable um, is a good call. Um, you know, in order to make sure that you're not wiping at the end to Kafka or to other strong bosses. I think you're exactly right. I think it's it, so. There's a couple other advantages. So I, I think it's a. Uh... It, you know, it's a, a pretty risk risk averse strategy, which I think is the play in a situation like this where you don't need to be in the lead. Now, Green Monkey also did something else very interesting. So I think you're right that it's it's good to set up for those those that last push to Kafka's Tower. You can go two and two, but Green Monkey very wisely scouted the other two bosses, and it looks like we're going to have some vanilla statues or some French vanilla statues anyway at the end of uh, Kafka's Tower. So what does that mean, knowing? ahead of time that you might be fighting at least one, if not two or three warring triad bosses at the end of Kafka's Tower. How would that affect your strategy? Dude, that's really smart on his part. I wouldn't even have thought about doing that. You know, it is obviously a slight time investment having to just quickly check and, and warp out. But, you know, we always complain that, oh, I was doing great until I ran into Doom Gaze with Party A and I had my all my best options were on Party B. Right, I ran the Magic Master, and I didn't have any defense uh, ignoring attacks on you know w with that party. That knowledge is really big, and you know knowing that it is one of the one of the Triad uh, statues is not as big as knowing it's a Magic Master. But that knowledge is really crucial because it really is going to allow you to come in and confidently take out those bosses, which is. The scariest part of the run, you know, in my opinion, is what are my statue bosses when you know you're not fighting with full strength? Absolutely. How many times have we seen uh, a promising race start to really go upside down the moment you get there and, and you fight one of those, either a statue or potentially a magic master or a guardian in one of those slots? Uh, you know, knowing that ahead of time, I think it's going to be a big advantage for Green Monkey. And I think... Uh, really really puts green monkey in a position not to lose and i think again that's just that's really the goal here just don't be in that bottom three and, and you're set you know it's not even about one of the strongest bosses too one a question comes up often in discord is why aren't espers being used more esper summons and part of it is there are useful esper summons if you know what boss you're fighting but the time save of it is not worth resetting out and fighting the boss again with the right setup and same with some relics and stuff like that big example being tentacles is completely neutered if you throw running shoes on people and it's not worth the reset out but if you know that ahead of time that means you can really save time especially if it's against something like tentacles walking in with the right setup for that fight and just be able to crush through it immediately um you know that knowledge i think is potentially very underrated so what i'm hearing from you is that Green Monkey should be taking that Crusader Esper and summoning. Is that uh, is that what we're hearing? <laughs> yeah, just you know, just keep summoning that. It does uh, extreme, uh, you know, a lot of damage. Just you know, ignore the part about it killing your own side. Um. <laughs> yeah, my understanding is that part is not good. We do see Fantastron now fighting Atma Senior, so we're still seeing some some fresh looks at some new bosses here. Uh, also seeing doesn't reviewing their, uh, their their progress down there. So. Are we are we seeing kind of a review? Are we seeing doesn't sort of take stock and decide whether they're going to go do the Illumina quest? I wonder. I wonder if it's that or uh, checking. You know, trying to decide if they want to do um, uh, if they want to be looking for the skip or not. Especially going in here, where you be able to peek ahead of time. Um, coming back to what we were saying earlier about pace, 
uh, doesn't really, you know, he was ahead last time we did a count, but his pace has, you know, stayed the same, if not improved, being at a uh, steady 15, you know, it looks like, you know, next we have is, uh, is Zelfer at uh, 13, and then we have some 12s, and uh, Dr. DT's also at 13, and Green Monkey at a, at a 10, um, so doesn't real with a really good pace and everyone else around roughly the same green monkey a little bit behind But we saw the time investment he had with the tower So it is a little asterisk by his progress where it's a little bit different with him And we do now see dr. DT also aborting on the uh, the Saban so dr. DT looks like committing not to go for the skip at least not on the character side and I think that's interesting too. So I, I think maybe that's another strategy nuance we're seeing here where some people willing to take a couple extra characters knowing that it's gonna open up more checks, more opportunities to get those espers. And also, you know, as a side effect, you're gonna get that skip. So still seeing some more diversity as I think we just saw another new character. We saw a Moogle get added to a party. Yeah, and I think that's gonna be interesting. I'm, I'm looking especially at Hash here who has enough character for the skip, but still needs six whole espers. And that really kind of, is going to make things frustrating for him because if he does any check that uh, doesn't let you peek or easily reset out and you end up with a character, that is just extra progress, uh, extra scaling that you're not getting anything in return for. You know, at least a dragon, you're getting the benefits of a dragon. You know, he's running a huge risk now with that ninth character where someone like Zelfer or doesn't running an eight right now knows they have the option to sit here and and pick up a ninth one easily somewhere else. Zelfer in particular, because he has that Sabin in the back of his mind. He knows he can always pick up Sabin at the end. So he can have a little more leniency if he ends up picking up a character by accident as part of another check. Oh, absolutely. And now we see Green Monkey getting uh, the Esper from Tri Talk, moving ahead to the Yeti Cave to get that one as well. Fantastivon deciding that he's going to spend what feels like minutes and minutes and minutes having Duncan teach the, the last blitz. Now, now, Seto, what's important about getting that last blitz? What does the bum rush really do? Yeah, Bum Rush is uh, very interesting. It is very powerful. It is uh, obviously Saban's ultimate blitz that even if you have a pretty average magic stat, you're looking at doing, you know, five five K plus. And if you have a above average or excellent magic stat, you're looking at almost a guaranteed nine 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 of defense ignoring um, non elemental damage. The downside is twofold though. I mean threefold. One, this scene takes forever to do. It's close to a minute. Um, to inputting uh, the bum rush uh, command can take a little bit of time, and that time adds up. And three, most important, you cannot aim it. So, bum rush is amazing against single target bosses, but against tier one and two, and part of tier three, it can show its weakness if the game decides not to be nice and you're just not targeting who you want to target. Uh, so, very powerful, guaranteed, unlike, say, finding an Illumina somewhere, but it has dis its disadvantages also. Uh, absolutely. And how many times have we seen two in these races where you've, you've rolled the dice on some of these random target, single target abilities on tier one, say, and uh, end up with a quake as a result. So it's it really is kind of one of those risky plays. But I mean, especially on single target bosses, Bum Rush can really, really shave some time off. Unfortunate that it comes so late where you can't use it to clear a lot of checks. But, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of real opportunity there in the tower especially for a seed like this where we still i mean i don't know about you but i haven't seen too many bona fide end game setups other than some level three magic yeah and uh that's why i would pick it up we called it at the beginning with the experience egg and shadow with blitz early it's a no-brainer there's not a lot of guarantees here we have the guaranteed dragoon set but the weapon's not guaranteed and who can equip it isn't guaranteed you have a guaranteed illumina but it's tied behind a lot of really horrible checks Early on, when you had the experience egg and you had Blitz, it was a, a guaranteed from minute seven end game uh, offensive maneuver, and that is very rare rules collide, and you gotta run with it if you see it. Uh, it's definitely a good call by all the racers who end up uh, going that route. Um, Doctor, absolutely. Pulling, pulling out whatever the seed gives you and using that. Now, we do see that the pain train has arrived right on schedule. They're, they're keeping the trains running on time in Mobley's, and this one is, uh, it's really given Dozen a, a bit of a headache here. Now, what is it about the, the ghost train that's becoming such an issue at this stage of the game? I imagine it's its evil toot with uh, how uh, scaled element works. He can start using this uh, ability called Evil Toot that will sit here and just cause a whole bunch of different status effects. Sometimes it can be just a mute, sometimes it can be three or four on one person. And when you fight with two, 
it can uh, either knock your party out or just cause a big time sink. And it looked like maybe Terra was uh, was knocked out for a bit with some status effect. I don't know. It looked like he was stalling on that screen for a tiny bit. You know, you like to see it end like that as uh, as we see a <laughs> suplex for the kill. I don't think there's any finer way to finish the no. ghost train than, uh, you know, turning it upside down and slamming right on its filthy caboose. That is exactly how you do it. Uh, you you know, unless you're a bad person like me who doesn't even know how to do suplex, if you're a true racer like the like these fine racers are, you know how to do suplex and you pull it out uh, when you see a train. It's just because that is what you have to do as a world's Clyde runner. You know, Seto, I wasn't going to expose you as a as a ghost train <laughs> pummeler, but uh, if you're going to fess up to it on stream, that's great. As we see Hash Malum doing a, a pretty late floating continent now. I think a lot of racers don't really love going to the floating continent this late. I do see Dr. DT, by the way, picking up a bunch of earrings. Now, what does that mean to get a bunch of earrings at this point? The earrings, my favorite relic on average. Uh, it is the greatest filler re relic. Uh, earrings give you a 25% increase in the magic, and they stack. So you could equip two earrings on, which I guess is technically four earrings. Because uh, earrings is plural, but um, you could equip uh, two sets of earrings on a character to give a a fifty percent increase to magic. Um, and earrings are cheap. If you can find them in relic shops, it is good to buy four or five of them in order to fill out you know the rest of your party because a lot of abilities and in this game are magic based a lot more than than is physical so it's always good to buy them because they're normally uh result in a good increase of damage and with that bum rush we're gonna see a lot of damage increase because like i said it's already doing multiple thousands and you uh, increase it by 50 percent and you're gonna get close to max damage with it yeah i think we're starting to really see some of the end game damage setups come together now we still have not seen anybody go back to kefka's tower for the second trip i do think we're gonna probably start seeing that pretty soon it's just a matter of where people are going to find these last few espers. Now, so yeah. where would you be looking at this point? So, it, obviously we know where things are, but, you know, with Hash, I think that is a a risky but understandable uh, gambit he is doing, where you're hoping that you don't run into any characters here. You have three checks, you know one cannot be a character, and you know the one at the end is guaranteed a character or an esper, and then, of course, the first one could be a character, esper, or item. With no free progression on, and you, uh, there are only two dead checks in rotation. And, you're, and if you're hash, you already found one of them in Mount Zozo. Um, Bone content's not a bad idea. Unfortunately, we know it's lock, and that is just gonna be nothing but a dead check for uh, for hash when he finds it. So that would be one of the places I would go. Uh, for anyone who hasn't done Dream, that is a very great late game check. Two bosses for three espers, really, really, really great. Um, but this is one of the problems you run into with no free progression is that uh, it's great not being able to get those dead checks, but there are just less checks by the time you're near the end that you sometimes feel like you're grasping to try to find the last character or magicite. And it's such a helpless feeling, isn't it? Where you just, you don't know where you can look and you start thinking about Kefka and Narsh and all sorts of places that you might have been trying to avoid all this time. Uh, now it's interesting too, we're seeing the, uh, the Phantom Train is being boarded by Dozen. So he's hopping on the train and it looks like... Uh, Looks like it's a, a, a Magicite hanging down there as well. So it'd be interesting to see if we see any other trips to the train. We're finally starting to see a few more of these novel checks. Also, we see Dr. DT and Daryl's Tomb, another place we've not seen visited yet. Yeah, I I think uh, Fam Train gets a bad rep. I think that being able to peak at the very beginning is immensely powerful. And I think that it's not a particularly long check if you don't go inside uh, and just quickly run through it. Um, be able to see at the very beginning is really strong compared to say, uh, you know, the next tower with Green, Mon Green Monkey's doing, which is multiple minutes, or even Daryl's Tomb, like Dr. DT, which, you know, if you get all the way to the end and you see it as a character, you did spend a minute and a half going all that way for nothing. At least with Phantom, with, uh, Phantom Train, you know at the very beginning what you're getting. And if you're doesn't, uh, and you see that ninth Esper, you know this is worth the time, the, the deal. Absolutely. You know, it's 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 that sort of knowing up front. And I think that's almost the challenge with that Hash Malum might be facing at this point where you've with the, the floating con, you're so committed. By the time you find out even that first check, the find the moment you find out that it's lock sitting there waiting for you, you've already fought two bosses, you've already fought three fixed encounters. So it looks like Hash Malum is carrying on and continuing with the check, but that's a that's a tough find at that point. I think at this point you have to, and it's not even the sunk cost fallacy. Um on a 
uh, I think I, it wasn't fully broken down, and I want to do it at some point. But Kel had a uh, had a Google Doc of time for the long longer checks, but also broke it down not only the time for the check, but the time on a per check basis. And for something flowing continent, the time it takes to do the first check is really not that great compared to a lot of other checks in the game. When you factor in all three and how long it takes you to go through and do all three, it ends up feel, coming out to be rather decent. And so you're already here, you have to go and see it through the end because it is a better time investment per check than it would be if you bailed out right now and try to go someplace else. Yeah, really almost the opposite of something like uh, the Magitek Factory where you don't have that upfront investment and a lot of the time it is sort of the correct choice to to get the heck out of there. Meanwhile, we're seeing Doom Gaze, who we've not seen yet, show up in the Phantom Force. Fortunately for Doesn't, uh, not dealing with any sort of level 5 multiple nonsense, so getting away with that one. Fantastodon now doing Kefka at Narsh. So we're still seeing some really interesting Green Monkey now fighting Stooges on the, the Fanatics Tower. So interesting that this late in the game we're seeing so many new novel checks that you know a lot of still kind of deviation and diversity in the, the checks that we're seeing explored here yeah and this is what you want to see in a race like this we called it at the beginning when we started seeing the sabins and the science and the shadows and terrors flying around you want to see rot divergence because you want to be able to look at it afterwards and for the runners to say oh you checked there and you found this oh i checked here and i found that whether it was running into a tough fight that other people didn't have to do, whether it was uh, getting 10 characters instead of 9, whether it was finding an Illumina that other people didn't. Um, route Divergence results in fun races for everyone to watch. Uh, maybe not always fun for the runners, but for us watching, this is exhilarating, this is fun. Uh, you would hate to see a seed that was a Mog, Yumaro, Gogo, Strago like initial characters because we would all be rather bored at this point. Um, it's exciting. We don't know how these routing, how this rally is going to play out in the end. I couldn't agree more. I mean, as much as everybody loves seeing Gogo and Umaro off the top, I think we've had a, a really, really interesting exploration of all the different ways you can go in, in a seed like this. I think. You know, we've got seven top racers taking seven very different approaches. It started pretty similar with some shopping, but by now these have all kind of blossomed in a very different directions. I think it's a real testament to sort of the, uh, the ingenuity we have from these racers. Yeah, and one thing to kind of point out, looking down at Dozen's screen, um, you know, he's doing some good damage to the Doom Gaze, but he's spending a little bit fighting it, and that's because at this point, you know, he is three characters over, he's a dragon over, I believe he's taken one dead check, um, I should probably actually double check uh, that one, but his scaling's getting kind of high, and now he's going to be going to, you know, Kefsa's Tower with a skip, but fighting these bosses with not a full strength of party. Um, Scaling can really creep up with this, you know, 2.5 uh, scaling with these non-progress things increasing bosses as well. And I think that's where you're really going to see whether Green Monkey's strategy really pays out is whether or not the end of his Kefka Tower is easy compared to some, someone like Dozens. I think we're going to see that very soon as we start seeing, I think, Dr. DT heading to the tower now. I believe we've seen at least one other uh, Kefka's Tower open up. So I think we're going to start seeing that pay off soon. It's It's... It's going to be again almost that tortoise and hare to see if Green Monkey's time invested. He's Green Monkey has probably done about half or more of the time that you would normally dedicate to Kefka's Tower. So if Green Monkey can finish up these last few checks quickly, uh, which unfortunately the uh, the Dream Stooges are trying to work against him on that plan, but we'll be interested to see whether that time got, does get made up or not. Yeah, Dr. DT entering Kefka Sour right now, but entering normal with not without the skip, whereas Zelfer and Fatasson now both have enough for the skip and doesn't as well. We're seeing Zelfer and doesn't uh, doing maybe some last minute selling and uh, biting and, and, and uh, stock trading and all that fun stuff. Um, and really, the skip, while good, it only gives you a few minutes. Uh, it, you know, when they come in, I don't think Dr. DT is going to be too far behind them. And all it takes is one of those, uh, you know, statue bosses to be mean or a Kefka tier two or three to be mean for this to be a different, a uh, completely different fight. Um, while Hash and Green Monkey are subtly be, you know, subtly behind, I don't think that, I, I think that all, this race is still kind of anyone's game, especially since we just got to figure out the top four. Absolutely. I think this could go any way. And I mean, it's funny that it's Hash and Green Monkey up there who, who are sort of going in an interesting direction right now because those are the two who last round had big upsets. I think both Hash 
against Druleth and Green Monkey against Javanator, both coming in uh, against opponents who had won every single week in that pod and managed to dethrone some kings. So, uh, you know, I think we learned last week don't cast, don't don't count these two out. Uh, but on the same token, we have uh, some real powerhouses, Zelfer and Doesn't down there, who again both dominated throughout the tournament. So, uh, you know, I think we see Doesn't now picking up that last blitz as well. I think it really is a, a tough competition here where now that we're seeing some people go to the tower uh, i think it's gonna be very interesting to see who ends up pulling it out on time because i mean we do know that there's at least two tough bosses in those last slots in kefka's tower and those uh, those can be some very timely and very costly wipes yeah and shout out to fantastic i feel like with all the talk of zelver and dozen who you know have both previously won tournaments uh Fidaston, who's been around for a while has been putting up some very good times to seed and he is now the first in with the skip uh so he definitely has the best pace at the moment uh he's been putting up some really top tier quality uh quality times uh and you know he we might see a first place victory out of him with how things are going at the moment absolutely and that would be that would be a, a great story to see i mean again we're, we're really i think this tournament really showing off some of the new fresh talent we've seen i mean this is this is a, a game that i think the community is growing very quickly and i think we're seeing some some new arrivals to the game who are really changing it up you know we're seeing even now how many runs have we seen and we still see today things like what kill Basiago and green monkey are doing really challenging the meta really making up new strats and finding new ways. Now, we do see Fantastron fighting the Welk. The, the Welk, of course, classically a very complex fight, a lot of nuanced strategy. What would you suggest about fighting the Welk in, in regards to attacking that shell? I mean, you know, I wish someone when I was eight years old warned me about, you know, what you shouldn't do during then, if there was maybe a, a soldier or two that would give you some advice uh, about what to do. But in all seriousness, uh, this is actually a little bit of a bad matchup for Fantastodon. Uh, relying on Bum Rush and Sword Tech here, both of which uh, he cannot target, and he is getting unlucky in hitting the shell. The shell is not doing too much damage uh, to him, but that is all time that he's not hitting the head. Uh, and this is kind of a little, you know, kind of a time loss here. A, a great call out because that really is sort of that double edged sword with these strong attacks that can't be single targeted. Shock, another great example, which we haven't seen today, but we always see a lot of discussion about is shock great? How great is shock? But again, when you get into fights like this where you need to be very careful about who you're targeting, shock, not so handy. And we know that there's at least three fights at the, at the end of the game that are those where you need to be very particular about what order you do your fights. Now, Seto, I want to ask you about what Zelfer is doing because Zelfer has to skip online. That the skip is is open and yet Zelfer's taking the long way. What do you think uh, Zelfer's thought process is with that? Yeah, this is interesting. Um, my my guess would be is that he is doing something similar to Green Monkey uh, uh, did, which is he's being a little conservative here. You can only use the skip one time. Pre 1.0, you could repeat the skip multiple times, but here you can only use it one time. So if you take your strongest party, you run them up the middle, you fight the boss like Green Monkey did, you, you scout the other two, then you know whether how to split your party, skip back in, and easily sit there and handle the, the two side statues. Um, I, if you're 1v1, it might not be the strategy you want to do uh, because it's a little too conservative. But with six runners and you just got to get, you know, top four of six, not a bad idea because the last thing you want is to get surprised. You know, you could have a great pace and all it takes is a doom gaze that keeps, you know, level five doom in you or, or whatever in order to uh, suddenly drop in time to someone who had a, a lower pace throughout the rest of the run. Uh, so that's what my guess is, is is doing the same thing Green Monkey's doing, just being conservative and knowing what you're getting into. Now we do see for Dozen, those uh, those early elemental shields coming in handy now is uh, a lot of these Doom attacks, which could be a problem, uh, bouncing off, getting absorbed. Not so much for Savin, but for, for Terra and Locke, a lot of these, uh, the, the value of those elemental shields. Now, looking ahead, Kefka's Tower, we've got the, the last four fights. Um, we've seen some espers go out. We've seen some of the uh, the other abilities. So we've seen you know things like Siren, Golem. What does that mean for how this fight is going to go? Do we expect to see some smooth Kefka's Tower fights at the end for Final Kefka? Yeah, I think we're going to see some smooth fights. You know, we we saw with Doesn't that he has Golem. Um, I'm checking now to see what uh, uh, what all of our runners have. Doctor DT has uh, Ben Rear as an example. Um, so give me a second, uh, and uh, I will find you know find some of the rest rest of these. Fantastic has Siren, which is going to make 
uh, uh, tier two a lot easier. We have Cleave with a lot of our runners with uh, Sword Tech. Cleave is the only instant death pack in the game that is a always 100% hit, so that's going to cut through tier 1 and 2. Um, as long as our runners have comms for protection, this is going to be a clinic of a uh, Kef of a Final Kefka fight. All the tools are out there, and it's just a matter of whether a runner has uh, found all of them. And if not, I believe every runner at least has some pieces of the puzzle to trivialize some of these fights. Yeah, I think you're right. I think all the pieces are there. And once again, big shout out to our trackers, uh, you know, Ceiling Cat and Schwantz, who have kept us up to date this whole race on what's going on. I even do see that Ifrit. So Ifrit was floating around with a magic power bonus. Have we, I, I mean, I'm curious to see if anybody's leveraged that magic power bonus to really uh, make a, a potent magic user for the end. Yeah, I did not get a chance to see. I, Ifrit, I do not believe, was one of the first uh, espers. And if you remember, a lot of our runners had problems getting espers early, and they were taking fights early. Um, so I don't know how much a factor that played in. That's something we should ask in our, our post-interview. Um, but I don't know how many runners had that option uh, early game. I did just confirm all of our runners do have golem, though. So all runners have calmness protection. Uh, and that's a big deal because all it takes is a, a bad calmness to wipe someone to cause someone to enter Final Cap a little bit later to uh, squeak by and uh, and pick up the win. Of course, that does depend on them summoning Golem. I don't want to say names, certainly not me, but sometimes people do forget to cast their calmness protection. So that's, of course, the, the big test you have to do is remember to use these espers. Don't be like me, kids. Don't forget to cast your calmness protection. As we see Goddess... Uh, you know, Goddess starting to cast some of those scary spells again. We'll be interested to see if Goddess is going to be uh, a roadblock for Fantastodon. Yeah, yeah uh, you know, Goddess is, uh, you know, really, I think it depends on what level. You you know, early Goddess is horrible, late Goddess is horrible, mid Goddess can be okay, can be not okay. It really depends on how RNG goes, but definitely when you're down two party members, uh, Goddess can be really rough. Uh, we do have our last uh, party member, uh, last people in KT. Green Monkey coming in normal, not with the skip, but uh, Hash Malum with the skip. Uh, definitely makes this interesting. Everyone's inside uh, KT now. Zelfer, we know, has the skip, but is going to be normal. Why doesn't Dr. DT Fantaston and Hash, you know, rounding up the rear of the people who have the skip? Um, you know, Good pace by everyone, but it's weirdly enough really crazy with the strategies Green Monkey and Zelfer did and with skips and not. This is not as straightforward of, a, of the end of Kafka's Hour as we're used to seeing in, in races sometimes. No, and we took a very, very convoluted winding road to get here with some some twists and turns from all the different racers. Now, Green Monkey not taking the conventional built-in skip, but he is going to be able to capitalize on that skip that he created himself earlier. So now we're finally going to get to see how much time and saving that does get him. Meanwhile, as we sort of anticipated, we are starting to see some of the struggles from these uh, vanilla French vanilla statues where it uh, looks like Goddess might be taking down Fantastodon. And that's that's always tough on, on dealing with that. Now, how much do you bang your head against these bosses before you kind of break down, warp out, and re redo the parties? Well, one thing that Fendaston should have, at least, I you know, I have to go back and, and look fully at it, but we have seen a, a Thunder Shield or two pop up. We have Elemental Shields, and while Goddess has a lot of attacks, a good amount of her damage dealing is electric attacks. And so, you know, if he has not broken that Thunder Shield, uh, that is a good defensive option. Whereas we just saw Dr. DT break his Thunder Shield, but I do not believe he has fought Goddess yet. So that is one of those cases where you have to wonder whether that is going to be a big regret in a little bit when he fights Goddess, not having that defensive option, whether that's going to be a different difference maker. Normally, I'm all in favor of breaking shields. You know, you can't take it with you, but uh, sometimes you, you know, it, it, sometimes you never know what the game's going to throw at you. Absolutely, as we now see, it uh, looks like Doom might be uh, might be taking Dr. DT Town. It's going to be very close if he can pull this back out. Struggle at 37 hit points, and Terra just now getting up with the Phoenix down. Uh, you know, once again, I think we're seeing some of these challenges from these uh, French vanilla statues. And, and it, it always brings me back to these racers. Now, you know, I think there's a lot of nuanced strategy in figuring out just when you're ready. You know, I think we've seen some, some deviation even here of whether people have made a beeline to the tower or whether they've sort of taken their time and, and built up that power how much of a difference do you think we're going to see that making as we come in here to see that prep work ahead of time smoothing the road i think that's gonna be a big thing for green monkey here he's already caught back up he knows what one of them is and 
I think we're seeing here something that I mentioned briefly before. I know I've ranted about it in my moments of anger, and I'm sure other people have felt this before, is sometimes you feel like with a race, you're like, oh, I sent the wrong person down the wrong path. I, of course, how would I have known what that boss is? I had the wrong abilities. If it was a different person here with a different spell or a different weapon or a different ability, I could have taken that and my opponent happened to send the right person. And you feel that frustration. And we're seeing this with all of our runners who are at, at these final statues. They're having problems with Doom. They're having problems with Goddess. They're, they're wiping. And Green Monkey and Zelfer, they know what at least one of these are. They know what they're getting into, and they have a little more options available to them. And this is a good case of being able to prepare for it. And it, I'm curious to see how this is going to play out uh, with it, because uh, you know, number runners, they don't want to warp out. They know how much of a time loss it is to warp out and try to take one or two, you know, take one of these out with a different party setup. Exactly. And I mean, and normally it hurts a lot to warp out unless you're Zelfer. And I think now we're seeing the Zelfer master plan come through as he's taken those levels that he's earned from his first trip into Kefka's Tower. He's taken those. He can get a uh, bum rush now. So he's going to warp out, grab that bum rush, and he doesn't have to take the long way. There's no walk of shame. He can shortcut because he did not use it during that first trip. So Zelfer, uh, he's been two steps ahead maybe this whole time. Yeah, I need to check to see what his level is, because we just saw a dozen screen and experience egg on uh, Shadow, uh, you know, his big Blitz user, and it being at level 52. Uh, I don't know what level his Blitz user was, but if he was sub 42, and that's what he's going for, then he really double dipped, and it looked like, yeah, it looked like he's 43, so that was the difference maker. Doing this double dip had the extra benefit of being able to pull bum rush, bum rush out where he wouldn't be able to normal if he just went in. Uh, very, very strong on his part. Um... And uh, I wonder if that was by design or if that was a happy accident he rose afterwards as he is having problems landing in Gethka's Tower. Uh, he's trying it again. Uh, there we go. He got it now. <laughs> you know, it's slippery sometimes. It's a very little tower. It's a very big airship. We all have problems like that. I'm not going to judge a person. If you've seen me drive the airship, you know what? This is this is masterful flying. This guy is... I, I think Zelfer might be Setsu reborn. So uh, I think... I think I'm not going to pass judgment as flying. I am interested to see. We've got almost everybody other than Zelfer fighting uh, warring triad bosses. We don't see this kind of neck and neck action very often. And uh, we've already seen some of these statues amassing a body count. Are we going to see some more people get through these or are we going to see a few more wipes? This has me excited. I mean, all of our talk about pacing before, of what people were doing, talks of skip, none of that matters right now. Everyone's roughly the same place. Um, you know, they're they're all struggling with these these fights. Some people might have killed a Doom, but no one's gone by a goddess yet as far as I've seen. Um, and it really shows when you have seeds like this where you have some options, but you're not given the end game builds, you're not given the Valiant Knife, Genji Glove offering, you know, level 60, you know, builds, magic power plus two kind of things. You have to really use what you have. You have to know how to use your equipment and your abilities and know how to prep your party with a little bit of stuff you have. And uh, that's really where you're seeing with Zelfer and Green Monkey here really kind of shine. Whereas I think our other runners are struggling because their party is okay when they're all put together, but when you split them and they have to fight these these top tier bosses, they can become at very least long and at worst hard. And uh, you know Zelfer's already through you know first tier of Doom, and uh, Green Monkey just you know kill, you know finishes Doom right now. Where Hash and Vedasimon have been struggling on Doom for a few minutes now. Yeah, that advanced recon for Green Monkey really paying dividends now. You know, there's no question of what party do I take and you know what do I have to be prepared for. Green Monkey knew exactly what he was getting in for, and and uh, you know it's paid off with a very smooth encounter. You can bring in two powerful people, well suited to each of these tasks, and uh, it's going to work out great. So I think exactly what you're saying. We're going to see Green Monkey and Zelfer, uh, their kind of measured approach to the tower paying off is now. Sure enough, Zelfer just right through Doom. And you touched on it before, this idea that we've been playing Worlds Collide for a while, and to see this late in a tournament, di this different meta being broken out, and by two different runners too, I, you know, I wasn't paying as much attention this week on Discord, so maybe this was a discussion spawn from there, or maybe these are just two people that both came to the same conclusion at the same time, but to see such a meta-changing strategy this late, this is why we all still play this game and still race this game, because it's not solved. It's, you know... Uh, it's not a solved game, and uh, Dr. DT is the first into Kefka at a 120 uh, pace. Um, he was 
I believe, the third into uh, KT with the skip, but he is the first into the boss now. Wow, Dr. DT made great time, you know, compared to some of the others where there have been a lot of these struggles with statues. Dr. DT is right through there. Of course, nobody's out of it. Green Monkey, uh, Zelfer, right on his toes. Doesn't he? Fantastodon's still right there as well. Looks like Hash Malum is, uh, is leaving and regrouping and coming back in, which... Again, a tough choice to make, and I think nobody likes to do that, to have to warp out, rebuild the parties, and go back in. But I think if you can make that choice quickly, I think it sets you up. Now, how, how do you come to, come to terms with that decision, though? I mean, when do you sort of draw the line and say, time to go back in? It's not easy, um, and with this, you know, th these, these top-tier runners, it's a decision Hash knows might be... Um, you know, the thing that costs them the match, but if you just can't get by Goddess, you don't have a lot of other choices. Like I said, you never know when another runner gets double calmness with Emilio and has to wipe and loses 10, 15 minutes on Final Kefka, right? And you'll easily make that difference up by uh, uh, if that happens. You And therefore, you're never out of it. You don't want to take that time loss, and odds are against you, but you you still have to do it. It, it I mean, it's better than spending what 15, 20 minutes beating your head against a wall that is not going to break down. Uh, if he feels like this is the only option he has, then uh, it's a tough pill to swallow. But you, you you have to do what you got to do. Yeah, tough choice, but I mean it's a it's a a strong choice. Almost like the uh, the times when you see people healing up tier three to get out of it. It's one of those heads up plays that you hate to have to make, but really the sign of a good runner to make that call and execute on it quickly. Better to do. Better do the right thing than you know do the wrong thing and, and take that much longer to decide it. As we see Dr. DT moving through tier one, and again, as you mentioned earlier, this is where we're seeing some of those pieces of the puzzle uh, really lining up and, and working to make this a smooth fight. We saw Cleave come out very quickly, take out that firearm. We've even seen an early Fenrir because, of course, as one of our astute trackers has pointed out, not only do we have Fenrir, we have Golems, so you don't have to save Calmness Protection for Calmness. You can you can use it now and, and have a much easier time and use those precious actions on doing damage and moving up rather than having to recover and recover, you know, heal HP and use up your consumable items. Right, especially because we have health, but the other only, other, only other healing I see is life too. And uh, I think health was on uh, Strago too, who is not with uh, the final party. So being able to avoid damage is great tier one can be surprisingly tough like if he decides to double hit someone and snipe the wrong person he does enough damage that even 3k hp isn't always safe if you have the fenrir use it. it is a smart move on tier one it is not something you see that often uh we do have our second uh person in final kefka zelfer at uh around 123 enters uh as dr tt moves on to tier two uh instantly cleaves and knocks out tools uh making very easy and i am checking to see whether or not uh dt did not get siren so i don't think he has mute to really trivialize uh this fight um looks like fantaston picked up siren and uh that might be it actually and we're also starting to see the the dangers of the aggressive scaling we're seeing in these late battle royale seeds uh things like ultima and you know meteor being cast out there as green monkey has been forced once again his second retreat from the tower and this one not a planned retreat now green monkey has to do the walk of shame and this this can't feel good as green monkey does that hash malum in the same boat hash malum you know, he's, he's used up that skip. And as you mentioned before, this isn't before pre 1.0 time. So that skip's a one-time ticket. Ash Malum already cashed it. So he's now fighting through that Inferno spot on his second trip through. Meanwhile, we still have Zelfer moving on to tier two and Dr. DT just about finished tier two. And again, they've got all the pieces. We're not going to expect any crazy wipes unless tier three gets crazy with one of those whirlwind, whirlwind meteor combos. I think we're going to see some fairly smooth flights. So this is a, a bit of a setback for Green Monkey and Hash Malum. Yeah, and doesn't enter the final fight at 125. Uh, you know, interesting to note considering his strong pace is the early part of the seed. And with Green Monkey and Hash Malum, you know, when the, you know they entered, they entered KT later than everyone else did. It took them the longest to get their final requirements. Uh, uh, you know, the underdog of me seeing that was very happy that they caught up in pacing, and it is just tough to see with uh, kind of how these goddesses, you know, how these statues work, and we're seeing that with Gaston as well, who entered the tower first, and he is still struggling with uh, with Doom. I don't even think he's fought Golmi, I think he's just been struggling with Doom, and so 
Interesting to see that Green Monkey's strategy, which Zelfer used, you know, very well, did not quite work as well for him. And I'd be, I really want to pick both these runners' brain afterwards, um, you know, because it sounds like them and Kelbyaso this week try to pioneer the strategy. Uh, and I'd be curious to hear some of the thought process and how they felt it worked. Yeah, you know, a really innovative strategy we saw, and I, I wonder, I wonder if this just ended up being a seed that wasn't conducive to it. You know, I, I think. It's a, it's a strategy that works very differently if that first boss in Inferno slot is Leader, or if that first boss is Narappa. But, you know, I think there's a few bosses you really just don't want to see there, and Big Fat Fumbaba is probably one of them. Yeah, I mean, he, like, offensively, not the worst this early on, but uh, he just has a lot of HP, and if you're not running a full party, um, which I think Hash might be. I think he did beat Doom, right? It was Goddess he was struggling on. So being able to just power through that, you know, is at least something. But it is slow. No matter how you how you slice it, that HP of, uh, of Phenoba is slow. We are seeing Dr. DT move on to Tier 3, um, you know, uh, with uh, this Atma Weapon uh, uh, offering combo and Stunner. Uh, girl should not be alive much longer. And like we said, this should be pretty textbook unless we get some uh, some bad tier three luck, some absurd luck or something. Yeah, Doctor T, Doctor DT, looking pretty safe, and you know he he's the one who kind of took the longest. He had that eight hours and thirty one minutes, so the longest total time of all our racers coming up here. But uh, you know has snuck into the lead. It looks like Doctor DT is is well poised to get out of here first, especially because uh, Doctor has those great offensive options. That quad. Uh, Quad Atma Weapon from Shadow is doing a good 10,000 per attack or per action. Uh, you know, we see Cyan doing almost 8k with his Quadra Slices. Uh, the Flares, the, there's a lot of damage being thrown out on Dr. DT's team. I think he's probably going to have a, a pretty capable fight with Kefka. Yeah, and he doesn't even have a bum rush. It really shows how strong Sword Tech is late game. And, you know, some runners don't like that Atma Weapon offering combo because you can't aim it. Um, but he had other tools to overcome that weakness, and at this point, with just sleep left in Kefka, that weakness isn't even a problem anymore. We are just looking at straight 10k as Calmness goes out and is easily affected by Golem, and Dr. DT is moving on to Tier 4. Absolutely. I mean, I get it. Untargetable abilities, they're, they're not targetable abilities. They're, they're certainly worse. And yet, uh, a Quadra, you know, a, a four times offering Atma weapon, that breaks, and we're seeing it now, break that 99-99 threshold. So if you can get more damage than quad nines, I, I mean, you'd be, you'd be silly to turn your back on an option like that. Yeah, and like we said, this is pretty uh, pretty textbook, as our other three runners are fight for fourth place all on Goddess at the moment. And I believe all of them have killed Doom. Uh, don't quote me on that completely because I am watching, you know, six runners like the rest of you are. But uh, we have, you know, this is close for fourth place. And like we said earlier, it doesn't matter if you're first or you're fourth. You move on anyway. And therefore, this is still an exciting race between our last, our other three runners, uh, Fidassan, Hash, and Green Monkey. Oh, no kidding. This is going to be a tight one. I think uh, I think we're going to be watching this one right to the end. Right. Um, meanwhile, Zelfer moves on to uh, Tier 3, and uh, like we said, should be no problem. Girl's already knocked out. Uh, doesn't on Tier 2. Uh, let me see if he... I believe he picked up a Siren I looked up. Um, uh, he did, so this should be a non-issue for him with the instant death. But we are seeing Tiger doing some mean Tiger stuff, but nothing that can't be uh, overcome. And again, we're seeing Dr. DT's uh, offensive power coming in. It looks like he's even uh, skipped right through Fallen One, and that's usually a pretty good sign that you've got uh, more than enough damage to take down Kefka. It is. So you do have to be careful. You skip through it, and you continue attacking. You do risk counterattacks before the goner charge happens. But he's at the point, we're breaking shields, we're casting quick. Um, you know, we just saw, what, 15k between those two shields and a quick shadow uh, with swinging that offering. We're going to see time here in a, uh, in a minute, I believe, and uh, and all that. You know, making quick work out of it. Um, and uh, we have, uh, in a second, I believe, time with him, and that is it. 130, 35. Wow. GG yeah, to uh... Dr. DT. That quick double, 
quad Atma Weapon Strike. I guess we call that an eight Atma Weapon Strike if we're doing quick math there. Uh, a quick 20k to take Kefka down. Dr. DT putting on a, a real masterclass, just uh, really blowing through one of the most seamless uh, final Kefka fights we've seen. Don't think he was ever really in any kind of danger throughout that entire uh, proceeding. No, and it really shows also, you know, the power or sometimes lack thereof of the skip. You know, he was one of our few runners that played Kefka Sour normal. He didn't scout it through. He didn't run a, a path through like Zelfer and Green Monkey. He didn't skip it. You know, he did, his, you know, he ran into all the same amount of characters everyone else did early, and he stuck with going in with the least number of checks and uh, ended up taking first with it. And I think the big you know, difference maker might have been the scaling, that even though he did not get the skip, his bosses were easier than other people's bosses. Oh, absolutely. It makes such a difference. I mean, even some of the nuances of just what party comp you end up with at the end can make such a difference. But I mean, at the end of the day, I think it comes down to Dr. D Dr. DT making some really heads up choices, uh, some really intelligent rooting. I think we've seen, again, uh, some, some great diversity in the approaches these racers took. And Dr. DT really, I thought, took a really thoughtful approach. And uh, I think he did uh, he did spicy chicken pod well, as uh, he is the, the one who came out of there. And it looks like now we do have our second Kefka Krakow. So Zelfer, uh, you know, not not a big surprise that we're seeing Zelfer advance as well. Uh, again, another really well run race, and another uh, another racer we've seen take a, a lot of a lot of wins. And uh, again, took a really strong approach to this seed, and it, it paid off. Yeah, uh, like we like we've been raving about different strategy. It paid off in its own ways. You know, it d definitely goes to show that there's not one strategy rule at all. We saw two different ones from Dr. DT and Zelfer, and the time difference between them was a little more than a minute. Uh, Gigi's a Zelfer, and you know, with our other runners, we have a dozen fighting through uh, tier three. You know, got a little mean with some uh, some whirlwinds, but shouldn't be a problem. And our other three runners. All tier one, all entering within a minute of each other for this Kefka it is going to be quite a fight for fourth place. Settled. This is exciting. I mean, this really at this point is coming down to just pure execution. Everybody, I mean, these are great runners. This has been a long tournament. This isn't, you know, people are new to the game. I don't think any of these uh, these racers have the, uh, the great diagram beside them of what to use on each of the parts of, of Final Kefka. It's really just raw execution. Uh, you know, equivalent power, I think maybe a couple levels difference here and there. Hashmallow, I think, has a slightly higher level party, but really this just comes down to who can who can manage the fight the best, and I think it's going to be a, a really, really tight finish. I can't wait to see who uh, to, who takes this. Yeah, and we know that Fidesson has mute, but we know that at least Hash has, uh, has cleave, um, and you're right, it comes down to execution. All the things I mentioned about scaling does not matter anymore but all it takes is a tier two to throw some curveballs that you have to stop and heal or a train you have to deal with that might cost you 30 40 seconds to recover from and this can be anyone's match you know it might just come down to the rng kefka gods now i do see that it doesn't look like hash malum and unless i missed did hash malum do the cleave or was he hard fighting both of those arms uh, I did not see. I would imagine you would do the cleave, but um, I could be, uh, you know, could be wrong. Maybe he, uh, maybe it's just a uh, last in judgment on his part. Uh, however, we do have in the waiting room both Dr. DT and Zelfer, and I figure maybe we can bring them in as we watch the end of this race and uh, get their thoughts. So give us a second as we move them into... Uh, Oh, here they are. Zelfer and Dr. DT, welcome in GG. Hello, guys. Hello, Hello, and thank you. Yeah, so we have quite a race on our hands. We're going to attempt to interview you and commentate because if you're not watching the stream, uh, you might be able to see in Discord, we have a dozen on Tier 4 uh, about to hopefully finish up and grab third place, and we have a three-way tie for fourth place with everyone on tier two uh, and finesse on green monkey being almost neck and neck going into tier two. Oh wow so sounds like it is an incredibly close race it's been close the whole time and uh you know you two i think really 
really were a big part of that. So I guess, I mean, why don't we start with, uh, why don't we start with you, Dr. DT? Uh, since you did dethrone Zelfer, who has not experienced a non-first place uh, finish in this one. Oh, hush. <laughs> <laughs> no, not throwing shade, but Dr. DT, what are your thoughts on that seat? What, what do you, what do you make of what just happened? I mean, I felt like I was just cruising from the get-go. Uh, I, I think I did something a little bit unorthodox in going up to, like, once I got Terra from Gauss check, um, I went, I think I went pretty much straight up to do the Welk check, and the reason I did that was to um, see, to get information on um, whether it was worth doing Yeti or not. Um, in uh, you know, so it was kind of two for one sort of thing. But then once I got Cyan off of that, I was like, okay, oh boy, I'm off to the races. Cyan with Sword Tech here, you know, this this feeds straight into Cyan's dream. This feeds straight into a ton of great checks, and it, I just felt like it went super smoothly from there on out. So and these my... experience egg seeds, you know, that, that's all. That's always a breeze. So my first question to you, because if you go back and watch this, you'll see that routing was all over the place, like you said, because there were so many options. Um, and uh, real quick, we have a GG to doesn't picking up third place, uh, finishing off uh, tier four. Um, but you did not go for a skip. And given that this is a seed with a lot of characters early, and I believe you were in the same boat everyone else of having four, five, six characters be you know, early before your first espers. Yeah, that's right. Um, six characters, no espers. And you only ended with seven characters. Um, it looked like maybe you were purposely trying to not even go for the skip. Walk us through your thought process of your routing involving that. Yeah, no, I was just, um, I, I was tr attempting to, um, so, so, let's see. So, I went into Cyan's Dream, and it gave me three espers. So I was like, okay, well, maybe I can uh, pull out of this without having to, you know, get extra characters to open up more skips. Um, I think I saw, I peeked uh, Doma Castle, and it was going to give me Sabin, uh, and I decided to reset out of that um, just because uh, I knew where he was. It was pretty fast to go back and get him if I ended up having seven, you know, eight characters later on. Uh, I ended up taking Setzer later just because Setzer had a couple of really quick checks with uh, Daryl's Tomb and um, and uh, Doomgaze Spot. Uh, and that was enough to put me over the end. Uh, though when I did Daryl's Tomb, it said, you know, here lies Ragnarok. And I was like, hmm, is this dead or is this, you know, or is this what I'm looking for? Fortunately, it wasn't what I was looking for and I was ready to go. So, oh, go ahead, Double Dub. Oh, I was just going to complain about here lies Ragnarok being ambiguous. Yes. <laughs> Now, what was your approach to Kefka's Tower? Because I think we saw some good deviation. You know, what was the thought process on skip versus not skip? You know, did ever did you ever consider making multiple trips? What was the approach to Kefka's Tower on this one? Uh, so the approach to Kefka's Tower was uh, I had just gotten uh, Atma weapon from um, from Mount Zozo and offering I picked up in Daryl's Tomb. So my goal was build up Shadow, who is my ammo weapon user, so that he could uh, do a ton of damage. So I stuck him on path three, where he'd hit three uh, bosses, um, and uh, gave him the experience egg. Um, I put Gao with him, because I thought Gao was the weakest of my other two characters. Uh, I felt like Terra and um, Cyan could handle themselves, and proved that they could, because we had natural doom and natural goddess. So uh, uh, yeah, that was a little bit of a nail-biter there. Um, and looking forward to going back and seeing if anybody else wiped to those, but uh, both Terra and Cyan were down at some point during those fights for me, so, uh, but still, I pulled through, so. Yeah, that Doom and Goddess, uh, you can go back and watch, but that was everyone's uh, stopping point. Um, you know, Phantasm entered the tower first with the skip, and he is now fighting, you know, for fourth place right now, um, because he struggled so much on it. Hash had a warp out, Green Monkey had a warp out, doesn't spend a long time with those um, and I think that now kicks into what I want to talk about, which is Zelfer. You had an interesting strategy involving Kefka's Tower, and I think we were able to piece some of it together on commentary, but I would love to hear your thought process and your explanation of it. <laughs> Alrighty. Alright, what I did on Kefka's Tower was I just sent my full party down past three, um, killed the Inferno spot, killed the dragon, and just sent them up and killed the Guardian spot and the Poltergeist spot. Um, one, to play it a little safe, and two, just to keep on racking up those levels. Um, I know I had Sword Tech, I had Jump, um, and I just wanted as much levels and as much power as possible. 
So I just wanted to get all the XP and hog it all like a jerk. And that's what I did. And... Was it, was it part of your plan to then pivot into bum rush afterwards? It seemed to route in very nicely when you worked out. Yes, I was tr trying to pay attention to my level. I was looking at my at the dragon like, do I need to take you? And I was like, level 39? I was like, yeah, I better take you. I better take you just so I could get bum rush and make sure just to completely have that and just have everything for the end. So... We heard in chat that this strategy of setting everyone up all the way up path to uh, the middle path um, and then coming back was something that was tested with Green Monkey and Kel. And we saw both of them do it, but they did it earlier, whereas you did it at the end. If you didn't have the skip, how would that have changed the strategy of yours? If I didn't have skip, oh, well, it feels a little worse if you don't have skip. That means you got to rerun everything that's like a three and a half minute walk i think that you wouldn't have to take normally so it feels a little worse then but um uh if you really need power i don't know what the good alternatives are do you take more dragons and raise scaling even more do you um i don't know i just it just i think it's worth it to eat it i think real quick we have our fourth and final finalist for the semifinals. Hash Malam with a 141.44. So Hash, who worked out of Kefka's Tower after a skip and had to walk all the way back, managed to come all the way back and and uh, grab that fourth place victory. So GG's in chat to Hash and congratulations. And uh, we'll try to pull him in in a little bit. Uh, so sorry for interrupting Zelfer, but uh, that's obviously a no huge, problem. huge milestone. Wow, really, I mean, I, again, really showing off the execution there as Hashmalum uh, just plays the fight and even, you know, manages to hard fight a couple extra arms, hard dodges some calmness, really just, uh, you know, finds a way to win there as we, we have now a great semi-final lineup. I mean, Hashmalum, doesn't he? Zelfer, Dr. DT, uh, wow, that's going to be a, it's going to be a tight one. Yeah, and, uh, Sorry, I did not mean to, you know, interrupt uh, Zelfer's explanation of uh, of his strategy. Did you end up peeking either the two uh, goddess statues when you ran through the first time? Since that's what gave people a lot of trouble, I'm curious if that affected your approach. Because it seemed like you were the only runner who did not have a lot of trouble with goddess or doom. Uh, I didn't peek them, actually. I didn't even step on the switch to open the pathways for the sideways. I just ran up front. Oh. Um... When you gain that much power, I was like, well, I don't think I care too much who's on the sidelines. I'll just split my main party two and two, and two people should be able to handle pretty much anything that's in my way. Um, I thought I was going to look like an idiot on stream, and I was like everything was going to be easy. But then I saw Vanilla Doom, and I was like, huh, okay. Well, you know, this makes me feel a little better. And then when I saw Goddess, I was like, okay, now I feel a lot better for doing this. This is all right. All right. So... Do you think scaling factored things? I think the big difference between you, Dr. DT, and you, Zelfer, was scaling. That you know you had overall two less checks, not including dead checks, uh, DT. Um, and I think that factored into getting through that really quickly. Whereas everyone who went for skips had a number of levels, you know, that really started becoming a wall. This final, you know, Kefka, um, you know, DT. Do you think that? That was a big advantage, be able to go as lean as possible. And Zelfer, do you think that that mattered at all with your strategy of grabbing as much extra experience? Yeah, well, I mean, that may be. Uh, I didn't think about it that way. Um, my plan was just thinking, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to do skip because if I can get away without doing skip, I feel like that's going to be faster for me. Um, just because it's, you know, three extra, three extra checks you got to do. But you're right, you know, that puts me. Uh, five levels uh, lower on my on my bosses, so yeah, maybe that did help out. Um, for me, I do purposely try to go as lean as I can normally. Um, when you get your seventh character before uh, any espers, and you know where the eighth character is, then uh, oh well, I guess I guess the one out the window. But I think the um, going through KT and getting as much power as you can kind of helps to counteract anything like that from happening. So. You know, it's kind of like a little bit of a fail safe, I guess, would be a good way to explain it. And real quick, we have our fifth place. Uh, we have um, a Green, uh, sorry, uh, Patassa at 144.41, and Green Monkey gets sixth place at 145.32. So 15 minute difference. 
throughout this race. So GG to our final two runners. Looks like we have another one of our finalists in here too. Looks like uh, Ash Malum. Can hey, how's it going, you? guys? Going oh, well, man. going well. Fourth, so that was a uh, fourth yeah. place. That was nerve wracking. Yeah, I mean, a, a bit of a bit of an adventure with Kafka's Tower. What did you What did you make of the whole seed there, Ash? Oh my gosh, so ridiculous! Finding ten characters, I could not find a magicite to save my life. I think I was at six or seven characters before I found my first magicite. So obviously, my routing was terrible. Um, but I was like, okay, that's fine. I'll get the skip. And then I get the skip. Goddess punches me in the face. I've got no way to absorb thunder. So I was like, great. I'll just waste the skip, warp out, and redo it. But then I couldn't remember which team could go on the third route. So I kind of split up between two and three because I knew there was the other boss there too. So, But it worked. And I want to say welcome to Doesn't Also. Sorry, you got added slightly late. Uh, our third place uh, runner. So GG to you too. Uh, you Thank know. you. What were uh, what were your thoughts? Sorry, we're trying to get everyone's thoughts in, and it's uh, already a, a busy room because there's a lot of runners. It's a pretty painful seed. I definitely mishandled it by not teaming Cyan, though, so it's my fault. But one thing, Dustin, I did want to ask you about before we before we move on too far. I was really curious about your your approach with Umaro doing the Yeti check early. I think you're one of the few who kind of went in that direction. What was the thought process behind doing the, the quick Yeti cave? I had resist gear, and I wanted to take an early boss while they were low scaled. And I can do Yeti Cave without adding anything to the belt unless I'm unlucky with the monster in a box. Definitely a good. That's definitely a good strategy. I would not. I also had flat damage and GP rain, so I could kill whatever came out. Right, because the dragon has what about 1.5k HP at that level? Because it's you're right, it was level three. I think. It's, yeah, I think the highest anything can have is uh, 2.5 thousand. Yeah, and with GP Rain and with Tear Shop, you're not going to spend that money on too much. It's definitely a uh, definitely a good call. Um, walk us through though your uh, Goddess and Doom fight uh, and kind of the adjustments you had to make with both of those. I mean, the Doom fight was literally just using what I had, which was Pearl jumping and swinging. Um, levels got really high. That was partly because I was intentionally took Burning House to ensure that I was able to get Domrush, because that was the only offense that I saw that would work in late game. But they just when you get your levels high, your physical damage increase, increases quadratically, while your magical damage goes up linearly. And so it, physical attacks start becoming viable. And so I was just punching Doom, because... I didn't have good spells other than Pearl, which stops working halfway. Goddess was the I more really should have done that. Um, should have gotten from Rush. <laughs> so Goddess only uses Love Token as a counter to physical attacks and steal. And when you're on your first quick turn, you can't get countered. And Goddess also has extremely high magic defense and fi extraordinarily low physical defense. And because Strago's level's inflated, he was better off swinging a Katana than casting his one of his puny tier two spells. So I was just quick, swing katana, and then cast spell. The spells will get countered with lightning, which is no problem with the thunder shield. But hitting, swinging with the katana was his best way of doing damage, and he had to do it under quick to avoid love token. That is some smart knowledge of the game scripts, because I did not know that about quick's interaction with the counter and uh definitely knowing that and knowing your you know your current offense with your limited party that is some uh good knowledge to get by what was a tricky boss for almost all of our runners um which i think is a good pivot to Fendacidon. uh gg on uh the finish uh, we didn't get, we didn't get a chance to introduce you earlier um and uh you know i guess give us your thoughts on how that went and how the, the end of the race went uh, that was fun, mostly. It uh, felt a little bit kind of like a plando at the end there, uh, with the uh, two statues and statue spots. <laughs> um, I mean, because other than that, they're really... I, I didn't run into any particularly difficult bosses at all until KT, and then I took me two attempts on each of the statues to get by them. Yeah, the end of uh, but KT... But I was also like, doesn't. I, I had bum rush and nothing else. Yeah, the end of KT was very interesting for a recap for the run the runners and for our audience. 
Um, you know, pacing was all over the place going into it, you know, with doesn't, you know, being very ahead of uh, pacing, but then we had some people with skips and some di didn't. We had Green Monkey who ran in Kefka Sour much earlier and killed half of it and came back later. Um, but everyone got to, everyone was fighting the two statues around the same time, and it really, those things were enough of a blocker and, and enough of a time sink with a lot of people that they really were... Uh, the, the great equalizer that pacing you know didn't matter as much once you kind of hit them so even wiping you know twice and having to go through and fighting say doom twice was uh, a really you know kind of a uh, big deal and I'm sure it sounds like with most of you that you know your limited offense really started really you, know, you really started feeling it there correct I, I ended up like the just the characters I found late because I, I did the skip so like my eighth and ninth character ended up being the stars of the statue fights. Like I had Mog doing Stray Cat Rage on Goddess, doing way more than anything Strago was doing. So Mog pretty much soloed her. Uh, and then I had Sabin, who was who just used the fight command and contributed a few thousand damage to Doom. And that was enough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was interesting seeing, I mean, especially with so many characters early on, I guess, you know, open question for the panel here, but when you've got that many characters with that many options and, and more than four viable paths to go through for picking your, your party. What's the decision making there? Like, how are you coming up with that team that's going to get you to the end? For me, it's usually who do I want to get the most experience on? Um, and who do I think can take a boss solo? Um, and usually those aren't the same person. Um, so uh, that's how I divide things up. I just try to think less, and I don't know if that's good advice because I came in fifth place, but I think sometimes you can get a little analysis paralysis trying to figure out the perfect party, and sometimes it's just better to stick with what you got. And I think we saw a lot of that. There's a lot of playing the hand that you're dealt. Um, you know, interesting too, seeing so Fantastron, for instance, you know, encountering Realm and, and sort of making that choice to not bring Realm along. So. I'm curious too, you know, with some of the, I think we saw some Atmoems coming out, but what's sort of the, the approach there to making that final decision of, of the, the offensive loadout? Um, you know, I think we also saw some Magic Power Plus One Espers floating around as well, but, um, you know, was there any ever temptation for anybody to go do, say, like, uh, get that Illumina from the, the three checks or uh, do their Dragoon set? Illumina was actually very tempting. I had that in the back of my mind for a lot of it. But I discovered Midwipe. Burning House didn't count. And I ended up with just two bad E-checks that were more reasonable to do. Uh, that would explain your... Uh, you spent like a few seconds on the, the tracking menu when we were trying to figure out what you were looking at. And we figured it was Lumina Skip, but I guess you were checking the Burning House if it factored into the Lumina um, check. I did, I did Burning House for both because I thought it went into a Lumina check. It doesn't. And, but also just to pump up levels, though. And it was Which, not the place to do it. No, well, there were some fights there, and then there was some trolling. Siegfrieds? Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I, I, I felt like the early... I mean, maybe some of the other racers had better grinds than I did. I found the early fights very unrewarding. Serpent's Trench was a bunch of dud fights. Uh, Burning House was half dud fights. Uh, oh, I just opened Red Dragon. To... What's up? I just op just opened Red Dragon. <laughs> Moro Cave fights. Yeah, you were the the big de uh, that was the big deviation early on. Everyone else did Velt and Serpent Trench, where you did that. You did you did Red Dragon first, and I, they definitely shut you know made made the early game interesting, and of course got really interesting once we started having checks open up uh, left, right, center. Um, but yeah, were there anyone else have any other final thoughts or you know anything about? I, we've, I felt like this seat in particular was just really crazy. Where all of you had so many options going on from a routing perspective and and everything. Yeah, you know, was there anything routing wise that you wish you maybe had done differently or explored uh, differently? I didn't need to do the route differently, but had I just grabbed Bum Rush like was my initial when I put the EXP egg on Shadow. I think he could have easily killed Goddess with Bum Rush, and I'd have saved from having to warp out, go back through. I mean, 
That would have saved me five, six minutes, probably. Of course, it takes a minute to do that. But still, if you're spending a minute to save five, that could have been huge. I have to ask, where was the XP egg? <laughs> it was in one of the way, South it was Figaro's. Way World South of Figaro. Balance, South Figaro. The, 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 barrel, barrel. the rich man's house. Yeah, the barrel. Oh, no. outside rich man's that house. barrel, I skipped that one. <laughs> yeah, you're the Every barrel I, you skips an illuminator and experience egg. I think you're the only one who skipped that one, Zelfer, and uh, that's what? why. Yeah, that. <laughs> That's why you were struggling so hard to get uh, that bum rush, and your strategy worked out per very well for getting it, but uh, that could have been a big difference maker, uh, whereas we saw most people throw that on Shadow immediately uh, in order to get that guaranteed endgame uh, offense. Good I think we've, we've, we've learned by now that obviously you never stop looting chests. The more chests you get, the more powerful you're going to get, so if you can get up to that 150-200 chest count, I think you're guaranteed a win. That's a, that's a great advice. I, I think that everybody should take to heart especially people competing against those of us uh, in the next competition. Loot 200 chests. That's the takeaway here. <laughs> the, looting like a looting. the last thing I want to ask everyone is, what are your thoughts on the Battle Royale so far, especially this flag set? This flag set really changed things up a lot, and I felt like a lot of people found it very fun, but what, you know, what, were, your, what are your thoughts so far on what we've been kind of playing with over the last few weeks? I do enjoy how the Splag set is high variability. It's not very consistent. Uh, if you're getting, yeah. it's going to be a gimme, especially in these grounds, like a gimme Flag set or kind of rough like this week's or this one. We it's could have this without the egg. Fast though, it's usually ninety minutes or less, which is really nice. Without being too easy, like you were saying. Yeah, I agree with Dozen. I think the variance is, is fun. I mean, we've seen, obviously, you know, 117 seeds and 150 seeds. And uh, yeah, I think a lot of that just comes down to RNG, um, which I think makes makes it fun to race and hopefully fun to watch. I've certainly watched a lot of Battle Royale races the last few weeks. Yeah, and I'm sure we'll be seeing some more. I mean, what's people's thought process? Any... Uh... Any hints for some strats we'll be seeing on the, the next flag set? Oh, safety Violent. strats. <laughs> Gain oh, that yeah, power. What's on. Yep, that's going to be something. Yeah, that's an interesting Kef question. Kefka Narsh Grind. First check, Kefka Narsh Grind. Watch it. Zelfer, with the strategy you kind of showed off here, is that something that when there's less competitors that you might not uh, utilize? You know, is it maybe a little too conservative? Oh, next week normalizing distorts on. I think it might be a good idea to be a little more conservative mm -hmm. overall. Other than that, I guess I just have to check barrels. I think the big thing with normalizing and distort is you want to make you do not want to under level. You want to make sure you have a healthy amount of levels and notably HP because if you do not if you go in at like 30 and you didn't have HP boosts you are prone to just getting wiped from full by Meteo unless you have Meteo skip then you should be fine if I play it like I played this one just go in at level 50 or so I'll be fine <laughs> I took two Meteos and I didn't care because it didn't even get my characters that low so I think it's going to be it's going to be a pretty tight race. I think the the four of you've been putting on a clinic so far here, and I think uh, next week's going to be pretty pretty interesting to see who uh, who comes out of that one unscathed. Uh, any other kind of final thoughts before we uh, close it off for the evening? I'm just curious what everyone's reaction was when they started the seed and saw it was a Gao Strago Umaro star. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good I'm thing shocking. my mic was off. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could do, I was thinking, what am I doing first? But... It was a bad Gao, too. Yeah, yeah I like Gao. seeing Gao. I like his start, and I like... And he can have two good abilities, but that Gao didn't have the best... I mean, GP range is great, okay, to start, I guess, but... I like a Gao start. I like a Yeti start. Honestly, I saw Strago, and I was like, nope. And I did not do any Strago checks for the rest of the scene. Amen to that. What was on top of the Fanatics Tower? 
Anyone went? I have no idea. <laughs> no one go. I did not even. I was it. tempted to go there with the Green, yeti, mo green I mean. monkey went there, but I don't. I don't. Re I don't remember what the item was at the top, but it was an esper at the bottom. Yeah. That is my, that is my other gripe with this: is the free checks were shields and armor exclusively. Yeah, it was all decked out for Merton and never found Merton. So, I think, appreciate so, the three bombs and the only attack spells I got besides Pearl. And not a single weapon to be found. I had I was dragging this useless lock around for like the Same. entire game. Oh, my lock turned out kind of good. I found I that more super and, late and an atma weapon. I'm trying to remember where others. I found my bolt three Esper because I definitely had bolt three uh, from half of the seed at least. I found it fairly late, but the bolt three was incredibly helpful. I don't remember where it was though. Bolt three I had bolt three and ice three by the end. Yeah, yeah it was on Ramu. Was, really was that from Ramu? Was a uh, Doma one, a Doma dream one. Oh, Doma, I am. Mm -hmm. There was also Ice 3 on Starlet, apparently. Who was that? Mog Starlet is the one I had. Well, it sounds like it's a pretty divergent seed. That's cool. Yeah. Like, I, I never found Realm. I never did Cyan's Dream. Oh, well, you were lucky not to do Cyan's Dream, because I did that as fast as I could to get Cyan the Sword Text. And then it was, at the end of it, it was Magi Master. Yeah, thank goodness for Terra's. I think did Terra have natural blitz, uh, natural berserk? She had it for me anyway. Oh, Somebody I learned it from something. Oh, you had berserk? berserk? What? Yeah, I used pummel Sortec one and GP rain to kill it. So while casting runic. Yeah, that's pretty much what I did. You were pulled off some GP rain because I hated Cal. classic. You were pulled off some impressive runic timing, by the way, Hash during that fight. <laughs> I was intense. I was. Uh, the second time fighting him, I'm like, it, it's this or I'm out. So glad it worked. Yeah, I just watched Green Monkey stream back. He never actually picked up the item in the chest. That he just fought the three stooges and went down to the bottom, which is very interesting because the item in the chest doesn't Top increase tier. progression. It's only when you beat the boss and then when you get the reward at the bottom. Those are actually two different checks. So for anybody that is curious, you could grab the chest and not increase scaling so but yeah it remains a mystery <laughs> something i found with with all of these battle royale seeds and I, I, maybe it's just like observation bias uh, i find it really hard to put together dragoon builds like sometimes I, in this seed there were a bunch of boots i never found a horn i played a bunch of other seeds where i'm just juggling a bunch of horns and never find boots. That's the, kind of the case in general. Agreed, yeah. yeah. That's we'll when you go set the clock. The <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's always the clock. That's a trap. I, I always support my opponents setting the clock. Exactly, Green monkey, me too. Three monkeys, that sounds about right. But I did not see what his spear was that he got uh, for it. I found a Pearl Lance doing Zozo World of Ruin because I wanted to kill another dragon. Figured I'd grab one dead. Well, I forgot it was a dead check, being honest. But then I couldn't kill the blue dragon, as he kept throwing water edges, and I had flame and ice shields, so... I know I got one of those somewhere, but Locke can't use it. So it did nothing. Oh, and I found Locke last. I didn't do floating con until way late, so I wasn't worried about trying to make a jumper. I think I did see a dragon horn in the shop, though. Will ruin Albrook, maybe? Yeah, that sounds then, right. I didn't need it, so... There's full imp gear in shops, too. Wow, really? I mean, there, was, there was defense for days in this You scene. need the horn. Yeah, yeah this was a full defense seed. Resists yeah. were plentiful. Offense was uh, limited. Well, any other any other closing uh, comments? I think uh, 
you know, I think it's a, a tight race, and I think uh, we've got another one now to get set for next week with the, the four of you. A uh, really well run race, well run race this week, though. Try saying that three times fast. Uh, any other comments before we move on and maybe visit on somebody else in the community? It's an offer. Yeah, thanks yeah, to all of you. Thank you so much. Shout out to my spicy chicken pod. <laughs> Congrats on the, the seven-way restream. I can't wait to watch it. It is chaos in the best way. <laughs> All right, GG, thanks, everybody. Good night, folks. GG's. Congratulations, Have a good everyone. One. Yeah, stick around. I think we're going we're gonna to raid Lunar Chimera. Um, so give them a shout-out. They are playing some Worlds Collide, as they usually do on their thursday night uh looks like they're doing the living seed so if you haven't done it yet and you want to watch it spoiler alerts ed but um we'll go do that now and thank you saber wolf for putting on the show uh you guys for doing commentary sealing cat for tracking with me and uh i guess that's it yeah huge shout out sealing cat schwanz 27 uh you two both really really great job staying on top of that uh, i think i tried to break your your tracking sheet a few times but you kept it going regardless of my interference so uh that was a ton to keep track of uh you both did a fantastic job hopefully everybody is already following you but if they're not follow away and uh yeah saber wolf obviously uh you know epic uh epic uh production here that uh you know moving mountains to get this going and uh, some great transitions and uh really really great you know it was an uh, awesome race and i think we had a, a great team behind it so all three of you wonderful job seto also i mean you know great comms thanks for carrying me and uh you know really really i think an enjoyable race for everybody yeah and i want to ditto all those thanks and you know thank you double down for being a great commentator and thank you to all of our runners uh all seven um it was an amazingly fun race i feel like i said this all the Every time I commentate or restream that of like, oh, this was one of the best races I've been a part of. But this really was the end of this was so uh, thrilling and being able to show all seven and have some of that production, you know, courtesy of Saberwolf really made this a special stream. And, uh, you know, shout out to everyone in the Battle Royale. I feel like it's been a very fun last last few weeks and everyone's been having a blast. And, um, you know, hopefully that those vibes will continue on to the last two rounds. And uh, good luck to uh, Doesn't, Zelfer, Dr. DT, and Hash Milan, our four uh, winners, moving on to the semifinals. Yeah, what a great competition so far. I loved competing in it. I've even more loved watching it. And I am, I'm really looking forward to next week. I think it's going to be an exciting one. And uh, I definitely will be missing it. Either will I, and we encourage everyone to join in, uh, everyone to follow along. Uh, it is going to be, uh, it's going to be really great, and you know we get to see the same stuff, just even more horrible with normalized and distort. So feel free to join us next week. Uh, time TBD. Please join our Discord. Uh, we post our events there, uh, and we will, as soon as we get the details from the runners of when they're free, we will make sure there's an event for uh, for this race and. Uh, you don't want to miss it, so uh, check it out. Um, and you can find all the information at ff6wc.com. And uh, with that, uh, I, I'm Seto Kaiba. And I'm Double Down. And I believe we're going to be uh, kicking off to uh, Lunar Chimera running this week's Living Seed. So like Swan said earlier, spoilers if you have not played it yet. Uh, but if you have or you don't intend on playing it, feel free to join us for the raid and we'll see you over there. Take care, everybody.